Bhattopadhyay, respected uh, speaker, Professor Yon Chuk Cho uh, from USA. So it's a good evening for you, sir, and all my Hi. respected uh, colleagues Hi. and student friends. Uh, Professor Yon Chuk Cho will be delivering his lectures, uh, followed by this one, after this introduction. Uh, his lecture topic will be uh, modeling and simulation inside versus outside in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Uh, a detailed uh, introduction will be done by Mola Madam. Before that, I just want to inform to the gathering that he was a vice president, president of Samsung Research till 2019. He's a former corporate vice president. So uh, I would like to request Professor Shivaji Bandhubadda, sir, to uh, welcome him, sir. Yeah. Uh, good morning to Professor Choi. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, it's a nice. Oh, oh, yeah. Obviously, not good morning, but good evening to you, because yes. yeah. And and uh, good morning, I think, to all my other colleagues and scholars who are present in the virtual meet today. Uh, so already uh, on 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 third of August when we uh, inaugurated the program. We also met you on the virtual platform. So a lot of deliberations about the institutes and about the topics of the uh, of this conference we have already come across. Uh, just to uh, share uh, our things that uh, at at NIT Silchar, which is currently uh, placed at the national level within the top 50 institutes uh, of engineering colleges. Uh, so. We put research and innovation as the focus of our uh, any sort of activity, whether teaching, learning, or or say the research activities per se. Uh, so the inquisitiveness in the minds of the students and the scholars, uh, in order to raise that, uh, so that is our our objective. And as a part of that, uh, we put a lot of trust on the undergraduate students also to have a research culture, research. Uh, paradigm within their mind frame uh, and uh, that is giving us good results also because in order to differentiate students of these institute and others we need a differentiating parameter that establishes a student who is from NIT Silchar and, uh, and the, the other part is that the interdisciplinary nature of research and, and focus on the artificial intelligence also uh, not only among the CS department students, but students in other branches. Uh, so that sort of inquisitiveness, uh, we try to increase among the students so that they can uh, uh, understand the, the activities in the nature, what goes on inside the brain, and how the artificial intelligence techniques can be, uh, say, applied in different domains, in different application areas. So we'll be, uh, we are eager to listen to you. Uh, from your your expertise also and uh, i think it is a good thing that this is a virtual se session but live session at the same time so that there will be a live interactions with the uh, with the viewers and the listeners and you also thank you professor Choi. thank you very much thank you sir uh, professor Van yeah. yeah thank you May I now yeah. request, yes, sir. May I now request uh, Dr. Molladuttu Meram uh, to introduce our speaker with the uh, with the participants and the guest. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, sir. Good morning to you all, and good evening to Professor Yan Suk Su. Professor Yan Suk Su received his B.Sc. degree in computer science from Yonsei University, Yonsei, Korea, in 1993, and his M.S. and Ph.D. degrees in computer science from the University of Texas at Austin, USA in 1995 and 2001, respectively. Presently, he is a professor and the director of the Brain Networks Laboratory in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M University. His research interest is broadly in computational neuroscience, deep learning, evolutionary algorithms, neuroimaging, and neuroinformatics. He has published extensively in the above areas with over 100 publications did include two base paper awards and one base paper award
examination. He served as a program chair for the International Joint Conference on Neural Networks in 2015 and many more. He was on the editorial board member of Neural Networks and IEEE transaction on Neural Networks and Learning Systems. Professors, now may I request you to kindly deliver your space. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the kind inv invitation. It's a great honor to give, give my presentation uh, to the Indian uh, scholars and students, especially. And let me just uh, switch this. So I, I was uh, really hoping to uh, visit Silcha in India because I haven't been to India before. Uh, okay. I had some previous chances. But also, by the way, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. yeah. Can you see the mouse moving around? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay great. Fine. Yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, it is through uh, multiple, uh, uh, I guess, in interesting and uh, fortuitous events that I came to uh, give this talk. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, uh, for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about uh, understanding the brain neural network control of simulated sensory mutations. Actually, I switched that title to uh, uh, understanding the brain from the inside and the outside. That's the, the title that uh, Professor Biplap Das gave. <laughs> So actually, uh, so I saw this on the program, so I used it, but actually the talk is more about inside and outside of the brain. So uh, that introduction was quite appropriate. So let me just go ahead. Uh, so what's the motivation? So this conference uh, is about modeling, simulation, and optimization. So I wanted to look at the brain from the perspective of modeling, simulation, and optimization. What can we, uh, how can we relate the brain to these three uh, interesting uh, tasks? So first of all, uh, we do a lot of modeling simulation in computational neuroscience to study the brain, uh, to gain deeper insights into the core principles. And when, once we uh, start speaking about these principles, now this optimization suddenly pops up. What, what does the brain optimize, for example? And uh, these are the principles that the brain implement. So this is an interesting way to think about brain science and its relationship to modeling, simulation, and optimization. So here, here's a brief overview about going inside and going outside. Going inside means uh, taking the investigation of neuroscience and computation neuroscience inside of the brain to ask this question, how to understand the outside world from within the brain? And that's exactly what was happening inside the brain. And going outside means uh, how can you go beyond the skull? So we think about the brain function as inherent to the brain itself, but can we extend this capability through the use of external objects like external markers or tools. So these are the three main topics that I'm going to talk about. Understanding within the confines of the brain, understanding the outside world that is, and then the use of external markers and tools by the brain or the simulated brain. So the first part broadly a categorized that going inside would be about this internal understanding. So there'll be two big parts with three major uh, topics. So current inv investigation in neuroscience is, I guess in a very limited sense, can be depicted like this figure here. So you present some input and you insert an electrode into the brain and measure the uh, electric current or the change in, change in voltage across the membrane. And uh, that will allow you to see what kind of input in the environment your neuron responds to. 
Okay? But this is, of course, conducted from the outside. You are studying someone else's brain or some other animal's brain. But uh, the question that, I, that we had is, can we gain new insights by taking this investigation inside of the brain? There are uh, uh, recently a lot of interest in this kind of uh, approach. For example, uh, Georgi Buzaki is a professor at NYU. He, he just published a new book called The Brain from Inside Out. So uh, what happens when we take this kind of investigation inside the brain and, uh, and somehow try to uh, address the limitation of this uh, traditional approach. So uh, the basic uh, problem in computational neuroscience is to understand the neural code. What do these, uh, the, these neurons generate some, something called the spike, neural spike. So they're sort of binary signal, a stream of binary signal generated based on some kind of input or some other activity going on inside the brain. So how, how do we understand what is the meaning of the neural code? So that is the question. Uh, but if we uh, state the question as this, how can we, from, uh, from the outside perspective, how can we understand the neural code, then uh, the solution that we come about may not be applicable if you bring it inside the brain. Because once you bring, it, bring that question inside the brain and ask how can the brain itself understand this neural code, then suddenly uh, this uh, approach is not applicable because you don't have it. These, uh, from, in, from the inside of the brain, uh, these neurons, the secondary neurons uh, or the second order neurons, they do not have, have direct access to the input or they, they don't have any knowledge about these uh, sensory organs or anything, right? But this question is the more relevant question to be solved by the brain. And this is uh, the more relevant question to be solved by the scientists. So once we try to address this problem, then it seems like an impossible problem to solve, which I'll illustrate in the next slide. So here's some kind of animation, something's blinking. So the question is, what is, what is, what is the meaning of these, uh, what, what is the meaning of this? What do these blinking lights mean, right? Or it's, it's a question of uh, rather, we can't even answer whether, there are four uh, lights uh, blinking and uh, blinking, uh, turning on and turning off, or whether there's one light moving around. We cannot even answer that kind of basic question just by looking at this. So this is called the grounding problem. What do these uh, uh, signals represent? What kind of environmental feature the, do these uh, blinking lights represent inside the brain? This is uh, from the brain's perspective. Inside the brain, if you, if you are the second neuron, as shown here, then it's looking at multiple uh, uh, first order neurons, and it'll look like this. So of course, the answer uh, in, in the context of the visual system is, is uh, in the back of everyone's head, there's a visual cortex, and neurons in, in the visual cortex, they respond to different uh, edges of different orientation. For example, here you can see that the first neuron is responding to a horizontal input. The second uh, neuron is responding to this diagonal input, 45 degrees. The third neuron, uh, vertical, and then fourth neuron, 135 degree. So by looking at the outside environment, the actual stimulus, and correlating that with the internal activity, with the internal state, you can then establish the meaning of these. So this is how the neuroscientists go about trying to figure out what this neural code means. But this is our perspective. And uh, the thing is that this cannot be, this kind of approach cannot be applied to the brain itself when you don't have access to these things. So here's, here's the problem. From the inside, it seems like it's an impossible problem so, to solve. And from the outside, uh, you can, easily solve this problem of what do these uh, patterns mean. But of course the brain is actually solving these problems 
there's some activity. Um, so when we humans see this uh, horizontal line in the environment, then some neuron activates and then we perceive that there is a horizontal line. And, and there's a vertical line, we perceive that there is a vertical line. So somehow the meaning of these uh, signals or patterns are being interpreted correctly inside the, inside the brain. But if you're given just this, it seems like it's an impossible task. So how do you solve this problem? The proposed solution is that in the front of this uh, central sulcus is the motor area of our brain. So these are uh, brain regions that are involved in actuating your muscles and generating movement in the arm, body, limbs, and also the eyes and, and other places in your body. So the main idea is that uh, this uh, sensory motor, through sensory motor learning, you can, the, in, from inside the brain, you can understand or interpret what is the meaning of the, uh, uh, these, uh, these patterns. So here's a, here's a solution sketch. How, let's say you have these uh, four lights blinking. How do you know what this light means? And then these each represent these orientations, but of course, from within the brain, uh, the brain, uh, you cannot, there's no way to tell these lights represent these different orientations. So let's say you have a joystick inside the brain, and then you're able to move around your gaze by turning your eyes. Let's say here now uh, your eyes are looking at this uh, stretch of the input. So of course, the whole in input environment is not uh, accessible to you directly. You only know that you're looking somewhere and then your second neuron is turned on. Then now you start moving. As you move, uh, as you can see, uh, these, uh, the gaze will go back and forth between these two line segments in the environment. And then one interesting thing that happens is that while you're moving diagonally, the second neuron is kept uh, turned on, right? So this neuron is uh, invariant over time. Okay, but as soon as you move in a direction that is not aligned with what is being represented, now you can see that there's every time you move left and right from the vertical to the 45 degree, you can see that the internal state changes. So there's something strange about this, uh, this kind of movement uh, where you move diagonally, this neuron does not change its acti internal activity, right? But if you move in a uh, direction that is not aligned with what, you're, what this is representing, that the invariance is broken. So again, if you move in a direction that is uh, aligned with what you're representing, then there's, there's an invariant, invariant property that is expressed inside the internal state. The key insight here is that the property of the motor output, like here, that maintains internal state invariance. So here's the property here is the motion, uh, the property of this motion is vertical movement, 90 degrees. Then the property is exactly the same as the property, the vertical perceptual property that is represented by this invariant pattern. Okay, so these two properties are the same when you achieve this internal state invariance. So going back to here, so in, even, even if you're in this kind of situation, if you're able to use your joystick, internal joystick, to move around, then you can find the particular motion pattern that will maintain the invariance in one of these neurons. Then the property of that motion is basically the property that is being represented. So that way you can figure out from inside the brain about properties of the external environment without actually going outside. So of course that's just uh, sort of a sort of experiment. So what we did was we uh, trained the reinforcement learning algorithm based on the objective of maintaining invariance. So given a particular state, which action to perform that will lead to this internal state invariance. So I'll show you a demo. So here's the simulation. 
So here are the four neurons that represent different orientations. Then uh, now initially, when you just look at this, you don't know what, what they mean. But as soon as uh, you start training, it'll move, you can see the eye gaze, the motion of the eyes. So initially, you cannot tell what, what these are. But after a while, you, you see that these uh, uh, the trajectories, eye trajectories tend to move in coherent directions. So here, it seems like when you're moving in this diagonal direction, then this last neuron is turned on. So this uh, may be that 45 degree neuron. Then when you're moving in this direction, this must be the 100, 135 degree neuron. Then when you're moving horizontally, this would be the uh, horizontal neuron right here. Then when you're moving uh, vertically, then this must be 90 degree neuron. So by uh, so after you're, you're trained, the agent to map the sensory state, the perceptual state to this, this particular action, you can now decode what these mean by looking at which actions maintain the invariance. And finally, uh, so uh, all during this uh, learning phase, the agent, is only, uh, agent only has access to the internal state and the ability to move. Okay? But uh, this is the input in the background in grayscale that has been used for this uh, training session. As you can see, just by looking at the tra trajectory of uh, the motion, eye motion, you can somehow recover the structure of the input. So uh, in, in the reinforcement learning algorithm, we, we construct this kind of reward table. So for the sensory state, perceptual state, you have different actions. And we try to learn the value of, of uh, the action value. So in this state, when you take this action, what, what should be the value, good or bad? So uh, in an ideal case where everything is straight line, then you'll see that for this uh, horizontal perceptual state, moving to the right or left would be the optimal solution. So uh, this whole reward table would look like a diagonal, uh, double diagonal matrix. So this is the ideal reward table. So uh, we train this on natural images and, and synthetic images. And uh, starting with uh, this, these randomized uh, uh, reward table, and then this is what is learned, which is close to this uh, double diagonal. So the error between this ideal and the uh, learned reward table uh, decreases over time. The reward in increases. Reward is based on the invariance from the previous step to the current step in the internal state. And the reward distribution, uh, like a lot of these negative reward, but after training, you get much higher reward uh, uh, and positive reward is peaked. And this was one of the inputs that you use, a uh, natural input for training. And this shows the motion trajectory during the initial phase of training. So it's kind of random because the this real table is random uh, based on which the policy that maps the state to the action is generated. And after training, as you can see, the motion trajectory, although there is some kind of randomness, which is built into the uh, policy function generation, you can see that uh, this, the structure of the underlying image is recovered. Okay, and this uh, we have uh, more recently applied to the fly optic flow system. So in the fly, there are, there's the retina, and then the lamina, and then there's the medulla and the lobular plate. So there are elementary motion detectors. When things move in this way, then uh, this particular neuronal output will uh, be positive. But when there is a motion in the opposite direction, they will generate a negative uh, response. So these are called the elementary motor detectors. And then when you put these together and uh, make these input side, the dendritic, uh, these are the dendrites of a neuron that uh, goes to the lobular plate. Uh, and these are called the lobular plate tangential cells. And here's the lobular plate. So these uh, neurons respond to a certain but, uh, horizontal motion like this. And look at the time difference 
you can detect certain things moving in the right right hand side or the left hand side. Then also there are these vertical neurons with these dendritic uh, branches or dendritic arbors aligned along the vertical side, a vertical direction in the left, middle, and right the visual field. So these are the vertical cells. And based on these, these flies can detect uh, optic flow. Like uh, when you uh, think about this airplane, you can change your attitude by rolling, by moving the ailerons, rolling in that direction, then uh, pitch is going up and down. The yaw is using this, uh, this tail fins. You can turn this uh, around this axis like that. Rotation uh, left, rotation right, pitch up, uh, uh, pitch up, up to down, pitch down to up. Then when you're rolling along this axis, the optic flows, uh, these kinds of optic flows are generated and you're moving forward or moving backward. Uh, this is moving forward and you moving backward. Then you can get these optic flows and there are neurons that respond to these. So the question is when you have these neurons, uh, how the, does the secondary neuron that receives input from these optic flow neurons know what they, what they mean? So it's the same problem as the orientation. We applied the same uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. Here's the reward table and here's, here are the different uh, uh, optic flows detected. And here are, the, uh, here are the different motions that the fly can generate. Turn right, turn left, turn up, turn down pitch up, pitch down, roll left, roll right, uh, roll, uh, roll right, and uh, go forward, uh, uh, go backward and go forward, then these uh, correspond to each of these different uh, perceptual states. Okay, and we use the same algorithm uh, with the same invariance criterion. So which uh, motion would maintain this uh, neuron from being active, for example. Then we trained it with three different images. And uh, for the synthetic input, uh, here is the results won't ask on, whereas in the natural scenes, uh, we get uh, a fairly diagonal result. which is close to the optimal. So to uh, summarize the first part, going inside and, uh, and trying to figure out how the brain can understand the external environment based on uh, information only available inside the brain. Going inside gives us a unique insight on how to understand the brain because uh, this is actually the problem that is faced by the brain itself. And motor exploration is key to autonomous grounding of meaning. Grounding means when you have an internal representation, what does it mean? What is the meaning of it? What does it refer to in the environment? The autonomous meaning, uh, you don't need any extra help from the outside to figure out the meaning. And uh, as we have seen, meaning is in large part based on these motor primitives the way that you can move. For example, if you can only move horizontally and vertically, then you cannot understand what this diagonal is, uh, given this kind of uh, situation that I've uh, described. And uh, so in large part, meaning is uh, based on motor function, not just perceptual features. So this is a uh, very reminiscent of uh, the embodied cognition approach and also some uh, philosophical views uh, like uh, Wittgenstein's uh, view on the meaning of uh, language, meaning in language. So he stated that the meaning in language is uh, based on the use, usage of words and so on, not what it uh, refers to in the environment. And uh, here we have seen that a very, very simple objective of internal state invariance can be used to learn the, the, uh, this kind of uh, sensory motor meaning. So you don't need something very complicated because biology is uh, sort of a, a bag of tricks 
right? Uh, in some sense, you cannot say that is uh, optimizing something and it's not using some very sophisticated mathematical technique, but uh, something uh, like this, just checking whether your current state is the same as the previous state, this may be very trivial uh, for even biology to implement. So there are lots of interesting related works uh, on uh, things like the mirror neurons and the motor map. And in, in AI, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting work in reinforcement learning on intrinsic motiv motivation, rewards that are generated from inside the agent. And uh, there are some theoretical work on uh, independently controllable factors. I won't go into detail. Uh, you can look at some of these uh, references. It's very interesting. So part two uh, has two topics. One is the use of uh, external matter or external markers. Uh, and the second is uh, the use of tools and, and the construction of tools. Let's go into the second part, which is actually the last part of this talk, but it, it's kind of lengthy. And in case there's some time remaining, I have prepared an extra part part three, which I uh, have not mentioned yet, but it, it's also an interesting topic. So uh, going outside, why do we need to go outside? So current neuroscience and AI are focused too much on the brain itself. It, it's sort of a dualism, brain-body dualism. And, uh, and furthermore, if you can think of it, this body itself is embedded in the environment. So it's not just brain, it's just just brain and body, but it's actually brain, body, and environment. So when we are studying the function of the brain, we need to address all, of, all three of these aspects to draw a complete picture of what's, what's going on, what's, what's, what is the brain capable of. So uh, in the uh, current neuroscience, the brain is mostly seen as a self-contained, self contained self-satisfactory device in enabling perception, cognition, and memory. So in some sense, this may be true. For example, when you're dreaming, then all these interesting things happen, perception, cognition, and memory, while you're not doing anything, uh, you're not interacting with the environment. So aside from that, uh, what, what we are interested in is, uh, that, uh, is the fact that the brain can do much more by extending outside of its skull and actively manipulating the environment. There are many ways of manipulating the environment and we're going to look at two cases. One is to uh, use some kind of external marker, dropping some breadcrumb, so to speak, or using a simple tool to achieve a goal. So, uh, so th this, these are the two topics that I'm going to talk in this going outside part using cell material markers. And uh, this is closely related to the idea of state merge. And also I'm going to talk about constructing and using tools. So uh, from a neural network perspective, we know about the feed forward neural network, which is reactive. It just takes an input from the present and generates an output doesn't have any uh, memory of past input that came by. So to deal with these past inputs, we have to have a recurrent neural network. But we can think about this question, is it possible for a feed forward neural network to have memory of the past? And uh, we can then think about what would be a minimal augmentation without changing the feed forward network's topology. We don't want to add loops to it because that's the obvious solution to give it memory of the past. So the idea was to allow material interaction by allowing it to drop and detect external markers. There is a typical task, that, uh, a very simple task, a simulation of an agent with some range sensors moving at, at the bottom of the screen, left and right. And let's say there are two balls falling from the above on the top of the screen. So one ball falls fast, one ball falls slow. So uh, with the range detectors, you can know where these balls are. Then uh, by looking at the ch uh, change in velocity, you can figure out which one 
is falling faster. And uh, based on that, you can move toward the fast falling ball to catch it. But uh, here you, you knew that there are two balls, but if this agent was controlled by a feed forward neural network, then by the time the, the uh, B1, the slow falling ball goes out of sensor range, then it forgets about the fact that there was a ball. So once it catches this ball, it'll stop. But if, it, if this agent had memory, it'll remember that there was something in the past and put that registered on this uh, uh, range sensor. So it'll go back and then catch it. So the task is to catch two balls. So this is uh, inspired by Randy Beer's work in 2000. So of course, of course, this task can be solved if you hook this agent up to a recurrent neural network. Okay, but can you do? Can you solve this task of uh, catching both balls using a, a feed-forward neural network like this? So this is clearly a feed-forward neural network. There, there are no loops in the topology. Uh, so the minimal augmentation here is to add two extra sensors extra sensors that point in the moving direction, left and right, in the horizontal plane. Then you have an extra output uh, neuron that generates a dropper. So if this, uh, so, that, so these two outputs would uh, dictate whether you move to the left or to the right. And these are the five uh, range sensors. So the third output would, uh, uh, if this is, when this is activated, it'll drop something and then move in, in whatever direction. So if you're supposed to move in to the right, you drop and move to the right. If you're uh, supposed to move to the left, then you drop in your current position and then move, right? So just by adding this and not changing the topology, we were able to show that this kind of uh, feed forward neural network is a dropper, dropper and a detect detector was able to solve this task quite well. So here we are comparing uh, the, this drop point detector net, which is the gray bar. So uh, can it, how, how many times can it uh, uh, pick up the fast left ball and fast right ball? So you have to be very close to 100% on both because otherwise if you just have a default behavior, then uh, one uh, fast left, left ball would be 100%, but the other one would be 0%. And compare that to the recurrent neural network, you can see that uh, there's, uh, the performance is com comparable. There's a typical behavior. You start moving uh, toward the first ball and then you detect the second ball. Then you get, go out of reach, but uh, once you uh, pick the uh, first ball, then you start dropping these uh, markers and then you are repelled by it. So this is kind of an interesting behavior. And uh, I guess we think that there is something interesting going on here because when you move uh, past something in the direction that you move, uh, that uh, it'll basically, uh, so once you catch it, when you move, then it'll make this decision to drop the ball. So there's always this overshoot. So here's, here's the horizontal plane here, left and right. So it, uh, the agent goes to the left, to catch the first uh, fast dropping ball, then go to the right to catch the uh, slow uh, slow ball, and it'll always uh, go uh, overshoot compared to the recurrent neural network as shown here. The overshoot. So this is one trial. And this is another trial. So as you can see, the position of the balls are randomized. Then the left and right first is also randomized. So we also applied this to a 2D foraging environment. So here's a agent uh, that can move in this 2D direction. Uh, so it has these uh, range sensors for the food and range sensors for the uh, marker actually. So this is incorrect. So it's not the nest sensor. It has the sensor to the food and then the sensor to the external marker. And of course, this is hooked up to this uh, feedboard neural network with the, uh, the sensors, marker sensors, and, uh, and the output, uh, which allows it to drop something in the environment. The task is to go to these food sources and pick, it, pick up the food and come back to the nest. 
then the, the sensors have a limited range. So uh, ideally, so when you go here and then now you, uh, at, by the point uh, when you reach food, uh, food location number one, you detect food location number two, but when you come back to the nest, then food, uh, food location number two is out of view. You, you can't, if you don't have memory, you cannot go there. So we uh, compared the uh, performance of feed forward network with dropper and the recurrent neural network with multiple, uh, some of these parameters that control, uh, in this case, the evaporation. So rho equals one is that there's no evaporation. Uh, rho equals 0.99 is there's some evaporation. Rho equals 0.7 is there's 30% uh, evaporation. Once you drop the marker in the environment, it will evaporate over time. So uh, they reach about 80% uh, uh, performance. Whereas the recurrent neural networks that they used, which was an Elman tower, lambda means, uh, uh, lambda means the uh, discount uh, rate across different layers. Okay, and uh, red, green, and blue mean how many uh, how many hidden states do you uh, have in the stack? Five, ten, or twenty? Okay, strangely, uh, when you have too much, I guess it uh, decreases your performance. But anyway, in this case, the recurrent neural network it did, of course, quite good, but not as well as the feedback network is the dropper. So the, if you look at the behavior, so these are the typical behaviors of the recurrent neural network. So the solid line is uh, from the nest to the food, food source. Best line is uh, from the food source back to the nest. Then uh, black means uh, the most recent. Then uh, dark gray means uh, the previous step. And then uh, light gray means the first uh, trajectory. So that the darkness represents the time. But in general, as you can see, it's just generating some kind of uh, systematic circular behavior, okay, whether that's uh, smooth or jagged, it's generating these circular behaviors to get to these food sources. So of course, uh, recurrent neural network can easily generate this kind of dynamic pattern, okay? but there's really no goal directedness in here. Whereas in, in our case, when you have the dropper, uh, especially this second case with the discount, uh, sorry, the uh, evaporation uh, parameter of parameter value of 0.99, it shows really a strong uh, directedness toward the goal and backward. Here is very very targeted because it's leaving these uh, the crumbs along the path that it go, explores. It's much easier for it to uh, be this uh, specific in terms of seeking out the food. So summary of the second topic uh, about external marker use. Before neural networks are reactive, uh, they, they live in the eternal present. They don't have any memory of the past, but with an ability to utilize these external markers, even with this feed forward topology, these networks can exhibit behavior requiring memory. And uh, there's an interesting uh, aspect of this that is, is using the environment directly as a canvas for memory. So there's no internal memory of any sort. It's using the environment itself as, uh, as memory. So I'll talk about this uh, maybe later on, but it's interesting how things evolved. So here's a, a reactive agent, uh, just a feed forward neural network. And now it's uh, equipped with this, this ex external marker. So uh, this can be sort of something like uh, as a, a, a olfactory system. Then uh, over time, uh, throughout evolution, this uh, external loop may have been internalized to form uh, some, something like the neuromodulator system. And it will now, it may have evolved into hippocampus. So hippocampus in mammals 
especially in humans, uh, are, are used for navigation. So, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Nobel uh, uh, Prize winning research found that there, there are these K cells and grid cells in the hippocampus which help with this kind of navigation. Okay, so last topic I'm going to talk about is uh, tool construction and use. So tool use is a very highly uh, developed cognit cognitive capability limited to only a few uh, species, but it's not that uh, limited, not just chimpanzees or primates or humans, but people have found uh, dolphins using tools and even uh, certain birds. Uh, New Caledonian crows uh, using tools. So tool use is uh, somewhat of a prevalent uh, behavior in highly developed animals, but tool construction is really, really limited. So it's only, mo mostly only in humans where you can see uh, tool construction, constructing composite tools. Of course, in a lab, lab environment, researchers have shown the chimpanzees with an appropriate setup, they can actually construct a composite tool by uh, plugging this uh, short uh, stick into this pipe. It can create a longer stick to reach uh, beyond this fence to uh, get the food, right? But this was a very, very uh, restricted, restricting environment. Okay, so why, why, do, why should we care for tool construction? Uh, so we think that tool construction and use can be a very strong measure of intelligence. And also if uh, we can develop some kind of AI algorithm where the agent can create these com complex tools, then the, uh, the evolution of the tools and the complexity of these uh, tools can have, a, have this kind of ratcheting effect. You make more complex tools and based on that, your intelligence improves. And based on your improved intelligence, you can build more complex tools and so on. And that's exactly what ha what's happening in humans. <laughs> so first we look at the tool, simple tool use task. So we have a simple uh, stick arm. We have two limbs and they're, uh, they're yeah, sensors, so the angle and distance to the tool handle, angle and distance to the target, then what's your current angle of these two joints? And now you need to control this uh, limb by controlling this uh, angle of your uh, joints. You have the sensors, you have the motor command, and uh, the target could be within reach, the first half circle is uh, the range of the arm without anything else. Then here, this target is out, outside of the reach of the hand uh, or, or the arm uh, without, uh, without using the tool, but it can be reached by uh, using the tool. Touching the tool handle will automatically connect and extend it. And uh, we need some kind of controller to uh, learn to control these two joint angles. And we use uh, the neural evolution technique. So we evolve these neural networks. So, so these are the sensors. So angle, uh, uh, angle and distance to the target, angle and distance to the tool, the limit detectors, you don't want the limbs to break them, break at the angle. And you have the joint angle uh, sensors. Then you have the two uh, output neurons, which, uh, which indicate uh, what, what, uh, what these two angles should be. <coughs> so, uh, so this is uh, just a brief tutorial on neural evolution, uh, encoding these uh, neural network weights in a chromosome, then doing this uh, crossover, and, and uh, I'm not shown here, but mutation. But uh, this uh, vanilla neural evolution is sort of limited. So we use something called NEAT, the neural evolution of augmenting topologies. 
Well, I won't go into detail here. But anyway, the main strength of this approach is that not just the connection weights, but the topology itself can be evolved, adding and removing nodes, adding and removing connections. And uh, this has been very uh, powerful, uh, has been a very powerful approach in trying to achieve a complex behavior. So the, when you have an agent like this, you can achieve this complex behavior uh, when the topology becomes complex. And of course, uh, with any evolutionary learning situation, you need this fitness. So this final distance, distance to the, the target, the number of steps that you took to reach the target, and the number of times you pick the tool up. And you can combine these multiple uh, criteria by multiplying them. And uh, these are the different combinations. So here's a typical uh, neural network that has evolved. So some, some of these criteria, a criterion, you can use it, uh, multiply it multiple times, like S squared T. Okay? And this was the network that evolved with this uh, fitness criterion. And this is a network that was evolved. So now you can see that these uh, orange colored nodes are the neurons that are generated. The topology can get um, pretty complex. And of course, there are recurrent connections, and if you follow through these, there may uh, there be recurrent connections. Also, there can be positive uh, excitatory connections and negative inhibitory connections. And these are the performance uh, figures for the different criteria. So when you include this, uh, if you reward uh, tool pickup behavior, generally they do better. Okay, 75% accuracy out of, let's say, 100 uh, targets and pick up about 70 of these targets. And uh, what's interesting is we can uh, look at uh, the property of the networks and, let's say, compare that to the, uh, the fitness. For example, here we looked at two cases where one uh, using the same criterion, but in one network, uh, the recurrent connections were allowed. But in, uh, in the other network, the recurrent connections were not allowed, loops were not allowed. So you can see that the fitness is much better when you have recurrent connections. Of course, it may be natural. And also, uh, using the same criterion uh, again, I mean, if you look at the number of neurons, how large is your neural network? So if you allow recurrent connections, you can achieve a much co more compact neural network that has uh, uh, about the same uh, fitness. Also, we counted the number of loops, recurrent loops, one, one, one hop, two hop, three hop, and so on. And, uh, we can see that, so each of these data points represent one uh, neural network controller, evolved neural network controller. You can see that the number of loops always positively correlate with success rate, regardless of the different fitness criteria that we use. So we can gain uh, very interesting insights uh, by analyzing these evolved neural circuits Here's an example network, another example network. And uh, you can look at the neural activity in a particular situation. Here, here's a time lapse of uh, this scenario. You start from here and then you go back and forth. And then now at this point, you pick up the tool. So your uh, reach is extended and then you move all the way here and then you turn and you reach the target. So there are altogether 15 neurons in here. If you count, there are 15 of these hidden neurons, so to speak, the generated neurons. And we can also, we can do clustering on these uh, neural activity over time. Then, uh, so here's cluster two, here's cluster three, here's cluster one. There are three neurons that have very similar behavior and, and so on. So we're still working on, uh, a more detailed analysis of the, these kinds of activations. But this is basically the brain. This is the brain of this neural network. And 
this is a very interesting small model system uh, which exhibits a complex behavior. So if we cannot understand these with exact uh, re replicability, uh, there's really no hope in trying to understand the brain. So here are some uh, actual uh, simulation runs. So you pick up the tool and you reach the target. It gets pretty good. So in this case, it picked up the tool unnecessarily. You can see it's pretty good. And, and the second task we, here we uh, tried was to construct the tool. So you have two, uh, two sticks, and you can pick up this tool, tool and then uh, extend it to the second tool to pick it up. So I guess I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll just uh, speed through this. But here, there are many uh, more complex uh, experimental settings that we need to uh, worry about. For example, where do you place the first tool and the second tool? Like first tool placement and second tool placement. And uh, can it be totally overlapping or can it be staggered or exclusive? Depending on these, you get um, various different topologies that evolve and also different performance. But let me just show you uh, the demo. So you can see that there are two tools so this will, this is only reachable with two tools. And then again, this is only reachable uh, by using the both of the tools. Okay, so kind of uh, undecided. Okay. So these are the success rates. As we have seen in the previous case, uh, now we, our, our best performance was about 70 to 80 percent. So we can achieve that depending on the particular placement strategy. So this was the uh, used in training, and then uh, this was uh, the tool placement during the testing. So of course, when you have the same thing, C6 and C uh, uh, C6 actually is this one. So when you place the tools like this, then you can achieve best results, regardless of the placement of the tool in the testing condition. But anyway, so in general, you get about 50% success rate, which is pretty good. So there are more demos. Uh, let me see if I can change this. Uh, by the way, how much how much time do I have? Uh, you can take five ten minutes more. Five? Five minutes. Five ten minutes more. Okay, great. Yeah. So here here's the. Let me share this. Uh, um, we have to share. Can you can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it's coming. Okay. Great. So let me show you this. So we, we made the test much more difficult by introducing this kind of uh, uh, gripper. So instead of just attaching to the tool, you have to grip it and then move this target down to the bottom. So in this first version, we just use the angles and uh, distance and so on as input and use this lead reinforcement learning agent to train it. So here, here are some examples. You, as you can see, you can uh, see that trying to grip and it's failing. And this is a physical, uh, physical uh, simulation. So there's friction and uh, sliding and so on. 
So here's another failure case. So it picked up the tool, but it failed to uh, reach and drag the target to the bottom. And here are some successful cases. So the task was to bring it down to the bottom. My PhD student was working on this task and initially the task was to uh, take, the, uh, take the particular target to a certain location, but he had a lot of uh, difficulty solving that. So I just told him, make the task easier, just try to pull it down to any part in the bottom and he was able, able to graduate. That's one lesson to you. <laughs> the students. <laughs> so here's in the second case, uh, my second graduate student, he worked on a much more challenging problem by taking this pixelized input, visual input, and then using that. So uh, the agent has to somehow figure out the angles and stuff like that uh, to generate this policy. So again, using this uh, deep reinforcement reinforcement learning algorithm. So here are some successful cases. And here we had three different tools. Because sometimes it doesn't use it as intended. And here's an interesting behavior. It'll actually throw the tool to achieve the goal. Okay. That was the demo. So can you see this? Uh, we are back to this uh, uh, original presentation. Can you see this? Yes, yes, we can see this. Okay, great. So in summary, uh, going outside, going beyond the confines of the brain, uh, which uh, only includes the network weights or integrated external memory, uh, such as in the, uh, in the neural Turing machine, for example, uh, we can go even beyond that external memory and uh, go into the environment and use that use the environment itself as a canvas. And uh, this can empower these neural networks, even very, very simple deep neural networks. And uh, to, uh, going to the final topic, tool use and tool construction can have a synergistic effect. So of course, this is uh, to us a uh, future work how can we make this uh, co-evolution of tool construction, tool use, and intelligence to happen? So there are many, many interesting related works in this. And uh, since I don't have much time, I'll just uh, skip, skip straight, uh, straight to the conclusion. So again, tying all of this back to modeling simulation. Modeling simulation is key to understanding the principles of brain function and uh, Researchers in computational neuroscience, AI, and cognitive science, they have uh, heavily depended on modeling simulation. And these are, allow us to uh, dig into the principles by looking at what are the things that are optimized, what should, uh, what should the brain optimize, and so on. So understanding the outside world is possible. So we learned uh, from this presentation, I hope, understanding the outside world is possible through sensory motor in interaction. Uh, and uh, we can use this very simple invariance objective, which is good. And reactive agents, such as uh, agents driven by feed forward neural networks can, can gain uh, memory capability through external material interaction. And then the road to open ended improvement of intelligence uh, could be opened by uh, tool construction and use. So these are some of these papers. Uh, that uh, have, uh, that we published around these topics. I have prepared some more slides, but I guess I'll stop here and uh, take any questions. Uh, hope, hope that the time is good. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for your insightful yeah. presentation. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Professor, with your permission, I want to say one sentence in Korean. If you permit, sir. Yes, yes, sure. Yes. Dedan hi dhamsa hang nida. Perfect pronunciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Now we can take uh, one or two questions from the participants.
And one yeah. question uh, from Dr. Alpha Biswe, madam. How brain censure work differently for left-handed and right-handed patient? Kindly make them understand from catching a ballpoint of view. Uh, so the question is, how does the uh, left-handed person and the right-handed person use their brains differently? And then yes, what, what is the but uh, catching a ball point, uh, catching of ah, I see, I see. Uh, <laughs> for for this particular neural network, so whatever is falling fast, it doesn't have a concept of left or right. It just looks at the uh, looks at the range sensors, and then see which uh, one uh, contacts the range sensor first. So it's not left or right, or, uh, but rather it's first and second. So which ball came into contact to the sensors first or second? That determines which direction it needs to move. I hope that's, uh, that's a sufficient answer. OK, so, thank uh, you, sir. Can I, uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, can I uh, clarify my question to sir? Yes. Yes, yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, sir, my question is uh, when some person are right handed and some person are left handed, it will be easier for them to catch a ball when it is not coming from the sky. It may be coming linearly parallel to their body. So uh, my question is, is sometimes it is uh, easier for the person to catch a uh, left handed person at uh, the ball with his left hand and uh, when the person is right handed person, then the, he or she can catch that ball uh, with their right hand. So when a lefty person and a right-handed person work differently, uh, so my question is that, how the brain sensor works differently for them? Oh, I see. So uh, your question was actually about the human left-handed person, uh, human right-handed person. Uh, yes. yes uh, yeah. Uh, so I don't I don't know too much about this left-handedness and right-handedness, but I would guess that uh, from my own personal experience that I'm I'm right-handed and my fidelity is better on the right-hand side, right? So it, you can control it more accurately or faster than the left hand. So uh, whenever the fall, ball is falling on my right-hand side, I'll be faster and more accurate in catching the ball. Whereas for the left hand, I'll be a little bit more clumsy. So I'll, I'll, I'll drop it more often. Okay, so, okay thank you. <laughs> kind of a dumb answer. <laughs> Sorry. And, um, Any questions? Thanks. Participants? No, thank Participants? Any questions? Uh, I think so, no questions. Uh, sir, I have one question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, in uh, slide number 30, and yeah. you have, yes, uh, taken lambda as a discount parameter. Yes, and yes. sir, uh, for the maximum limit, uh, you have taken as one, and the minimum limit is uh, 0 0.7, sir. Yeah, sir, yeah, yeah. my question, yeah. yes, sir, my question is that, is it possible to have the minimum level, uh, that is minimum level below uh, 0.7? Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. So okay. one means to preserve everything from the uh, previous layer. So, okay. Uh, the previous layer activity is multiplied by lambda when it's passed on to the next layer. So that's what lambda means. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank so, you so much, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, any questions? Any more questions from the participants? Hello. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I have one question. Yes, yeah. sir. Please carry on. Uh, thank you, sir, for a nice presentation. And thank you, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity to ask question. Uh, sir, uh, one question I want to ask. Suppose uh, uh, accidentally we do some work. For example, if we burn, then we uh, put our hands from the fire accidentally, immediately. Yeah. So uh, the signals that are generated from our body, so how brain will recognize that uh, for particular signal, they have to respond, or uh, for particular signal, uh, they have to not respond. For example, if we have to immediately think uh, that uh, we have to put our hand back for some time, 
then it will be burned so some work we do accidentally that means immediately without any thinking for example if uh, we are driving a car and any hidden things for example any person came in front of us then accidentally we uh, our leg has, has been go to the back so uh, that means how this uh, our brain is uh, responding to such type of signals uh, in which uh, that brain has to think or not yeah so that's a very good question so there are certain uh, parts in the brain that quickly respond to the sexual signals right so when you uh, walk, walk in the dark uh, you see some some big object moving then you quickly uh, quickly try to avoid it. Or let's say you're walking in, in, in the baseball field and you yes, see but... a ball flying toward you in the peripheral vision, then you act almost immediately without even thinking. You don't have time yeah, to yes, perceive yes, it. Yes, right? yes, that's I want to like that. yeah. yeah. And I believe that there's a part in the brain that's called amygdala that uh, deals with the, these kinds of things. Even though we astonished that how we have done this work, after doing that work, we know that uh, we have done this. Yeah, of Such course. Thing. After you avoided it, you say, "Hugh, uh, I've avoided this uh, baseball that was about to hit my head." Right? Yes, yes. So you only realize after you are actually uh, active. So it's kind of an instinct, instinct. I don't know if I gave you the uh, satisfactory answer, but the brain is built up on, on many, many ancient uh, parts like this, right? So, yes, uh, yes. so all, all animals tend to have something like this. They, uh, when you, when you, even for a single cellular animal, like amoeba, if you poke it with something or generate a puff of uh, like a noxious chemical, then it'll retract this uh, whatever tendrils right so all yes. of these are built-in instinctual behavior yes. yep. thank you sir thank you sir thank, thank you sir uh, once again i want to thank you for your informative presentation now over to dr biplav sir uh so it was very informative uh, presentation and we are sorry that we could not uh, manage it to this time invite you and bring it to India because of this ongoing pandemic. But uh, we are sure that we'll try to this one extend the this uh, link that is generated maybe in future future program. We'll surely inviting you and we hope we'll accept our invitation, sir. Yeah, I would love to uh, visit and uh, I'm greatly honored to uh, have given this talk and Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. So our next uh, presenter, uh, speaker, Dr. Ritapurna Dutta is here with us, I think. Yes, I am Amhilari. Yeah, please uh, switch on your video, sir. Is video required? Required actually? It's late oh. night and okay, okay, okay. okay. I prefer okay. not to switch on. Okay, okay. You, you can, you can go. Yeah, maybe go. I can switch it on uh, during question session. Okay, sure, sure, no problem. So uh, we can we can start it, Ritupurna sir. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Dr. Ritupurna sir, uh, would like to welcome you on behalf of Comso 2020, and it is very nice, and I'm also thankful to you to help us to get the other speaker, uh, Professor Yuan Chok Cho, who has just finished his lecture. It was very informative. Now may I request uh, Dr. Muladatta Bura, Madam, to introduce the speaker with our uh, audience. Madam, please. Thank you, sir. Good morning to all and good evening to sir. Dr. Rituparna Datta is engaged in teaching and research with the computer science department at the University of South Alabama, USA. Prior to that, he was an operation research scientist in Boeing Research and Technology. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering at IIT Kanpur. 
His current research work involves the investigation of efficient algorithms for engineering optimization, evolutionary computation, constraint and multi-objective optimization, neural network, machine learning, manufacturing, and robotics. His research has been published in 14 internal SCI journals, two edited books with sprinters, four book chapters, and research paper published in around 50 international conferences and more than 10 national conferences. According to the Google Scholar, he has more than 600 citations in his research. He is a member of ACM, IEEE, and IEEE Computational Intelligence Society. He has been invited to deliver lectures in several institutions and universities across the globe. Dr. Ituparna Dutta has been invited as a keynote speaker to more than 10 international conferences during the last seven years. Now, may I request you, sir, to kindly deliver your speech. Thanks, Professor Bora. And first, I would like to say good morning and good evening based on your time zone. And my first thanks goes to Dr. Biplab Das for inviting me for this presentation. And actually, he was my junior during my undergrad studies in Near East, which is in Arunachal Pradesh, which is near from NIT Silchar. And after that, I think we last met maybe 15 years back and it was an opportunity to meet him in person but we could not meet okay let us now some technical stuff how can i share my screen sir in the right hand corner uh, there is a present now button so you can press there Present under the screen, you put the mouse and click mm -hmm. somewhere in the screen. At the right hand bottom, you will see present now. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes, okay. it's, coming. it's coming. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, nice. Is it visible now? Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Okay. So today, basically, I will present about recent developments and application with multi-objective optimization and also a little bit predictive learning. Already, you have. Uh, sir, please open the PPT. I think, or you are just giving the introduction. Hello. Hello. Yeah, please click on the PPT and uh, go to the PPT mode. PPT mode. Whatever is there in the screen, new screen, that will be visible to us. So you go to the PPT set or it's not supporting anything. Presentation, Presentation mode. Presentation mode. Yes, yes. So in the present now you got your option like you enter screen, right? Sir, am I audible? Sir. Yes, yes, yes. So you, Can't you, you pick... see my screen? Uh, no, no. You, you have you shared the whole screen, entire screen? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Vibhav sir. Yes. You can share your screen and can show him.
Open the PPT. Open the PPT. He's open the thing, but it's not supporting for you. Sir, will you please unmute yourself, Ritaparna, sir. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Actually, I have shared my screen. Yeah, but uh, it's not like yeah, two, so, two monitors, I guess. Yeah, no, no. Okay, I will, I will just remove one monitor, just a second. Yeah, I have two monitors, so. Now, can you see? Otherwise, I will just disconnect my other monitor also. No, we cannot see it. Okay, just a second. Let me just present from my laptop. Now, can you see my screen? No, I guess you can no. just uh, share a specific window. Not the yeah, now I have just single window. Oh, now here, yeah, now I see your mouse moving. Ah, oh, okay, okay, that's great. Then, yeah, click on it. Yeah, open that, open the PPT. It's open yeah. here. You click the PPT, uh, is it open, opened in your PC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is opened on, on some other side. <laughs> no, I am just using laptop. I don't have my. I just disconnected all the monitors. Oh. Sir, you can see your desktop, but PPT is not coming. Okay, just a second. Stop it. Now? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it is coming. Now it's okay. We can see it. Okay. Okay. My apology for all these issues. Okay. So. Today, I will discuss basically my research work with multi objective optimization and a little bit of predictive learning using evolutionary algorithms and neural networks. And this is the outline of the talk. Rather than going to, into the theory, I will just discuss how we have used multi objective optimization, evolutionary computation, and other machine learning techniques in different mechanical engineering problems. <coughs> As I was invited by Dr. Das, and so I will first start with thermal engineering, design of a plate pin heat sink, then I will move to manufacturing applications, then I will go to design of a robot gripper. So here I will cover manufacturing, solid mechanics, thermal, and then some other applications like parameter identification of polymer, then one of our work with Indian Rail, another of our work with ISRO, then naval propulsion system, then design of airfoil, then predictive maintenance of aircraft because I was working with a aircraft company, and then how to detect counterfeit hardware. Okay, so my first application is design of a plate pin heat sink as you see in the right side side of the figure so this is very common to us actually in every electrical and electronic device they generate heat when it's plug into electricity and this type of heat either it can damage the whole device or part of the device because if we run it's more the heat is getting generated more and more so there should be some mechanism has has to be there to throw the heat out so that to we can ensure that the heat generation is goes out and for that actually heat 
plate fin heat sink is used and here basically we have first designed the plate fin heat sink taken into consideration two different objective function one is entropy generation rate and another is material cost why entropy generation rate if i do or if i ensure minimum entropy generation rate so my design will ensure that no heat is generated inside all the heat is thrown out but here as my only goal is to get rid of heat generation then my design or my optimization algorithm can say that to use a heat sink having larger size but if i use a larger size of heat sink in electronic device it is difficult because now with respect to time all the devices are getting smaller and smaller more smaller device more high performance so and also if the heat sink is really bigger in size the cost will be more so here to get rid of this we have also included another objective which is material cost so material cost will ensure that the device is small in size so now we can see how both the objectives are conflicting in nature my entropy generation rate will ensure that no heat is inside all heat is getting out on the other hand material cost will ensure that the device is small and later i will also show that we have extended it for three objective optimization also and here we have worked with two different case studies one with flow through air cooling system and another is impingement flow air cooling system and as i have two conflicting objective functions as a result i will get multiple solutions rather than a single solution and all these multiple multiple solutions have equal importance and now it depends on the decision maker which solution he or she will choose if the decision maker wants minimum material cost it will be maximum in entropy generation rate and vice versa and here after having number of solutions which we also called non nominated solutions because all solutions have equal importance and then we have analyzed how we can make effective decision making from these solutions here here is the picture of <coughs> two plate fin heat sink so the left one is flow through air cooling system as the name suggest and as you can see the flow velocity is in a direction parallel to the heat sink on the other hand we have impingement flow air cooling system in which the flow velocity is downward direction so in one of one of the heat sink the flow is going horizontal or parallel to the plate fin heat sink and another is going in the vertical direction and after designing we will try to compare which is better okay so now after having little bit of introduction to a domain let us understand what are the steps involved in engineering design optimization because optimization and mechanical engineering they that are like sisters because in most of the designs thermal manufacturing we need optimization so for any engineering design of any real system first we have to understand what is the need of optimization and based on the because generally in our daily life also we do everything based on the need and thereafter we have to identify what are the design variables or what are the design parameters involved by changing that we can get improvement in my design and thereafter every physical system has some limitation either it can be resource because we know that the resources are limited and there may be some constraints from dynamics some constraints from functional requirement some constraints from space requirement aesthetic requirement and geometrical requirement physics 
there may be many constraints so first we have to identify the parameters by changing which we we can get a better design then we have to formulate what are the restrictions or what are the parameter bounds in which we can change the parameters and find the better design and then we have to formulate the objective function and basically we are interested in getting a better value of objective function either in minimization point of view means let's say i have a result with me if i am doing minimization i will try to achieve lesser value than that on the other hand if i go for maximization i will try for a higher value and after that we have to come with an initial design and with the initial design we have to analyze the physical system and thereafter we have to use an optimization algorithm to find a better value of the objective function and then if we get convergence or if we get a better than the existing ones we will tell it as optimum design and then we can send it for fabrication otherwise if it doesn't converge so we have to again analyze the physical system I, and then we can understand either we miss some constraint or some parameters or some ob extra objective functions to be identified objective function to be changed so this is standard for any physical system any mechanical system electronic system any system okay and whenever we work with a real life system most of the constraints and objective functions are non linear non convex multimodal discontinuous in nature and as a result that derivative based and derivative free optimization many times they cannot perform on the other hand we have evolutionary computation based optimization technique we also call this as nature inspired computation technique which is inspired from <coughs> nature and they basically work with some probabilistic method and they doesn't need any derivative information and as a result last 2 3 decades they have already proven their efficiency in many problems so here in our problem we have the non linear objective function and constraint so that's why we have used evolutionary multi objective optimization and as i already said my entropy generation rate and my material cost both are contradictory to each other let's say if i get this one let's say minimum entropy generation rate sorry if i get let's say maximum entropy generation rate it will be minimum in time in terms of material cost on the other hand if i choose this point which is let's say minimum in entropy generation rate it will be maximum material cost and vice versa so now out of all these solution decision maker has to identify which solution he or she wants and some usual approach to solve this kind of problem one of them is called weighted sum approach in which we put some weight in each objective function let's say if i have two one of the weight could be 0.5 0.5 it means i am giving them equal importance than 0.25 0.75 infinite combination is possible and then we have another methodology called epsilon constraint methodology in which i convert one of the objective function as constraint and then solve it as a single objective optimization problem okay and now this is a standard formulation mathematical formulation of any op multi objective optimization problem i can have m number of objective functions i can have j number of inequality constraints i can have k number of equality constraints but in engineering design we rarely have equality constraints because we cannot fabricate or we cannot design anything with equality constraints It's really difficult even if there is equality constraints we try to put some tolerance in it and there are some constraints and variables as i said here our variables are number of fins then height of the fin then spacing between the fin and incoming air velocity and here we have used one of the standard 
multi objective optimization algorithm it is known as non nominated sorting genetic algorithm i am not going into the details and here are some parameters and the formulation let me just go to the results so here we have used two different approach to find the non nominated solutions between rate of entropy generation and cost so here i have many solutions from which decision maker can choose which solution he or she wants but it is also a critical task for the decision maker how to make decisions out of all these solutions so to make it easier first we have identify what is the minimum and maximum entropy generation rate and what is the minimum and maximum cost but then also it is not that clear thereafter we have taken <coughs> around 10 uniformly distributed points from the state of our all nom nominated solutions then we have noted down the value of entropy generation cost then all the variables but if i give it to the decision maker then also it's confusing because it is some numbers and from numbers it is not that easy to make decisions so here then we are try to identify is there exist any common principle between the design parameters and objective function so if we can show there is some common principle exist after the optimized design then rather than seeing only the data the decision maker can see a particular approximate mathematical relationship and he can he or she can come up with a relationship and then we have seen that many times number of fin doesn't change sometime height of the fin doesn't change but spacing every time it changes and most of the time incoming air velocity is fixed so next we will identify is there any relationship exist and if exist what is the relationship and why some of the value got stuck we will identify one by one so first <coughs> to identify the relationship we try to find a relationship between entropy generation with the number of fins and we were lucky enough that we have seen that the relationship exist in two zones as i said there are many value fixed which is here basically this was my upper bound so i never let my optimization algorithm goes beyond the upper bound so it got stuck here and there are many solutions and i identify both as zone 1 and zone 2 and in the first zone we have fitted a cubic polynomial so that rather than giving only the data now the decision maker knows that number of fin and rate of entropy generation their relationship exists like a cubic polynomial the same kind of study has done for another variable but here we are not lucky like the other variables here we could not find two zones but for uniformity we have just identified two zones but here also we have fitted a cubic polynomial but as you can see the cubic polynomial fitting was not so great but it can give us some approximate solution the same study um, also done for another variable but here we are um, we can see two distinct zone in the zone 1 a, a linear relationship exist and in zone 2 it's like a cubic relationship and then we have done for other variables also so here also as most of the value stuck means this is the upper bound so now i can tell my decision maker if you allow me to violate the upper bound and go beyond that maybe there is a chance that we may get a little bit better in the objective function and then the similar study is done for the others i will just finish little bit quickly because i have more applications and time is running so similar <coughs> study has been done with other fin also and here it was surprisingly most of the variables are fixed only one variables is changing every time so this is actually basically responsible for all the designs so now if i want to do optimization again i can i can fix all other variables and i just can play only one variables and 
then my com computation will also be easy. And here, as I said, most of them are constant. So either they got stuck in upper bound or some intermediate bound. And only one variable uh, which is changing. So we have found a cubic polynomial, sorry, a quadratic fit and approximate relationships. So, and then when we compared <coughs> fin one and fin two, uh, we have shown that the performance of fin one is better, but the uh, if I want to do optimization again, then the good thing is for fin, fin two, most of the variables can be fixed. So both have their own advantages and disadvantages. And then we have moved it into three objective functions. And we have also done thermal simulations to see the temperature distribution. So then we have included one more objective that is pressure drop. And then we have done three dimensional optimization for both the configuration, but sometimes it is difficult to take decision or understand the surface. So then we have also took two objective function at a time and see how the relationship exists. And we have also done the study to see what is the dependency of the parameters and what are the approximate relationships. Okay, so my <coughs> second application is on micro machining operations. So basically here we have also solved with two case studies. The first case study, we have used two different objective function, which is operation time and used to life. And then we have worked with another objective, another three dimensional optimization in which we have operation time, then cost per product and surface roughness. And here we have developed a new approach. So for generally in multi objective optimization, we get the solutions. And then, as I said, these are probably probability based approach. So after having the solution from multi objective optimization, we take each solution and if and we try to find some derivative information exists or approximate derivative and try to use some conventional optimization based method to improve the final solution a bit. And then we do and then we declare it as a solution and then decision maker takes the decision. And here what we did after having the solution, we try to find the relationship between design variables and the objective function. We call it as innovization study. Innovization means innovation through optimization. And then we use the local search. So the usual approach is after having the solutions from multi objective optimization, just do the local search. But here what we have done first, we have understand the relationship and then we have done the local search. And so how, and we have used different algorithms. So first we have used NSGA2 to find the trade of solutions. And then we have used epsilon constraint methods to verify the extreme points to use so that we can use different algorithm and see if the solution matches from different algorithms. Then also we have verified different intermediate points. So First, we have received the whole set of non-dominated solutions. Then we have we have checked few extreme and intermediate solutions. And I am skipping the parameters. And this is the solutions. And you can see the individual and intermediate solutions. And then <clears throat> here we have also done some kind of statistical analysis because as I said, these are probabilistic approach. So sometimes we have to take multiple runs, changing different parameters so that to show that are we really getting similar solutions or not. And then we have done similar kind of study. And compared to the heat sink, here the relationships are more straightforward. I can say that in zone one, the relationship is linear and we can say that for a quick operation time requirement the turning speed must be large this is intuitive but here what we can find here even we can give approximate mathematical relationship because i know that for quick operation time time i have to 
increase the speed so that it will, the job is done fast. But here our study can um, reveal approximate mathematical relationship. So that is the beauty of our study. And then we have done for other variables. I am not going into the details of due to time. And then the same is also done for second case study with three dimensions. And here also we have done the same. <coughs> okay. My third application is robot gripper design. So robot gripper we know. And here basically we have worked with two finger robot gripper. And here also we have used two case studies. So here basically our motivation is to design a ro robot gripper which can act like a human hand. And here the design variables are the link length and the joint angle. But only thing is to move the robot gripper, we need an actuator to actuate. And with the mo movement of the actuator, the robot is getting open and closed. But here we so actuator movement is a parameter which is changing, but it is not a design variable. Now, if I give fast actuator movement, then my computation is very fast. On the other hand, I may miss some of the configuration. <coughs> but if I move the actuator very slow, then computation time is increased. And we have also seen that for some configuration of the actuator or some value of the actuator displacement, the mechanism doesn't exist. There is a locking of mechanism. The, even the shape of the gripper doesn't exist in simulation. So this is one of the configuration. Let me just show the video, but I don't know if it will play or not. Can you see my video? Is my video coming? No, no, no. OK, so let me skip the video. OK, let me skip the video because I have other videos also for more grippers. And here, basically, as I said, for some values of the actuator, the mechanism doesn't exist. So here, we have understood what is the relationship between the actuator force and actuator displacement. And we have seen that a very nice, like a normal distribution curve relationship exists. And as a result, we have used a classical golden section search. And then we have came up with a hybrid method, which is a combination of evolutionary multi-objective optimization with golden section search. And then we have used uh, different algorithms with different parameter settings to obtain the non-nominated solution. So now, after receiving the non-nominated solutions, so what is basically my all non-nominated points? Actually, my each point is nothing but a gripper. So then, to understand the shape of the gripper, we have taken two extreme points and one intermediate point, and we we have drawn it with exact geometrical dimensions. And these are extreme two extreme and one intermediate point and visually if we see can we see any difference we can't see any difference because it is no scaling with exact variables and all looks same so then it will be more confusing for the decision maker because they look same so then we have tried to see the relationship between each variable with the op with the objective function. And we have seen that most of the variable either got stuck in low, lower bound or upper bound or intermediate bound. Only the last link, the last link is varying with the objective function. And it has given us a motivation that by changing the last link and, on, and keeping other links and joint angle fixed, we can grip different objects. Then when, have, when we do the experiment, and then we have come with a telescopic manipulator. It's like a telescope, or I don't know, many, many of us would have seen the antenna in the radio. We can make it, uh, it's like a telescope. We can make it bigger and smaller. So here our study said that if we would like to have a tight grip, we need the last link as small. On the other hand, 
for a loose grip, the last link can be more. And we, <coughs> we have developed it, the prototype. And the similar study is also done for another gripper. So here also same study has done. But here, as you can see, here also we have plotted two extreme and one intermediate point. And here we can see that they look different. And then we have performed the innovation study to one, and we have seen that some of the variables are fixed, some, some are changing, and then we have found the approximate relationship to help the decision maker. And then we have compared both the gripper. And then we have shown that gripper one is better than the gripper two. Can you see my another presentation? No, 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 not yet. Can you see now? Uh, no, sir. No, no, sir. Now, no, now it is visible, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, sir, sir, can you make it in a full no. screen mode? Yes. Now, is it visible? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So, after solving is as a two objective problem, we move it into a many objective optimization, having five different objective functions. And here, this study is more interesting. We we have taken inspiration for one of the gripper from one of the fish parasite or fish gill. So as you can see in the left side, it's called Tretrancas momentaron. So this is a parasite in fish, which looks like a gripper. And the other one, as you see here, this is an artificial gripper, which is designed by the robotic scientists. So here, basically, we are interested to compare a living system because we know that nature is the best optimizer. And also, we know that now people are trying to mimic bio-inspired or everyone is trying to mimic nature. So here, we are basically trying to prove is nature nature is a better designer or the robotics scientist. And for our criteria is five different objective functions. And another beauty is that for the conventional gripper, so whenever the actuator moves forward or pushes, the gripper is getting closed. But in the living system, when actuator goes backward or pulling, the gripper is getting closed. So it's like a compare between either pull and push based mechanism or nature versus robotic scientists. And here we have used a piezoelectric actuator and we have <laughs> actually developed different configuration of piezoelectric actuator and which give us four different optimization problem for each configuration. And we have two configurations, so we have eight a different objective fun ob optimization problem. I think I have three minutes. I will just quickly finish in three minutes and then maybe you can give me extra five minutes for question and answer. And then when we have compared the results of all the eight optimization problem and our study says that even if the nature inspired design is little bit better in some of the objective functions, <laughs> But artificial gripper also has its own advantages. And my next work is based on parameter identification of a polymer. So here I will just take 30 seconds maybe. So here basically uh, we have taken four different models of uh, viscoelastic material. And then we have tried try to come which model gives us better so 
here we have um, two objective function one is <coughs> based on the displacement transmissibility we have to match the simulated one and the experimental one and one is we want to minimize the mean square error in which we want to match the whole curve on the other hand we have peak transmissibility we want to match the peak and here we have used four model one is kelvin model kelvin void model jenner model barger one and barger two and our study shows that jenner model is based and here also we have shown basically each each point is basically different configuration of experimental and simulated one and highest error is by budget two model and then this is for a three piece bogey for the dynamic response of indian rail so here we have used actually two different approach so for the indian rail there is no mathematical relationship between because everything is based on their experiments and the, one one data itself takes three to five days so we just had 36 data points so with this 36 data point first we use different <coughs> regression and we solve we used four different objective functions and after that we saw that one of the objective function is redundant and then we solved it as a three objective optimization problem and then we but it's difficult to analyze then we have also done study taking two objective at a time and thereafter we have also extended the studies but i am not going into the details and then this is one of the work we have done with isro for parabolic space antenna so here basically we have done shape optimization for different control points with shape memory alloy actuator and here we have two different objective function one is the mean square error and another is the voltage and basically we are interested to know what is the temperature of the shape memory alloy in austenite and mountain side phase and then another of our work on Neville propulsion system so here basically we are interested for condition based maintenance and here we use neural network combined with principal component analysis and then we have also worked with design of airfoil in which <coughs> we have used neural network uh, along with pca regression and only neural network and we have shown that pca as pca is capable to get rid of the redundancy information so pca with neural network outperformed the best and then this is another interesting study so this study has been done with boeing 737 aircraft and here for maintenance, we have came up with a hybrid method by integrating decision tree and neural network in which neural network is applied in each node of the decision tree. And we gave it an interesting name, failing, fall, um, failing and not falling, F and not F. So failing is OK, but it should not fall. Because failing means passenger will not be in risk, but if it is fall, passenger will be in risk. So, with our F and not F method, we when we compared with precision and recall with neural network and neural network and decision tree, we have shown that the neural network decision tree performed better. And then <clears throat> another is now we know there are many uh, many chip manufacturer which who are actually supplying our as counterfeit chip. So here, basically, our interest is to find detect the counterfeit hardware, and then we have done classification and uh, classification and prediction. So how to classify based on the hardware performance? How to classify the vendors? So first, we have done classification, and then we have used neural network and principal component analysis, and we ha we have identified which is the best architecture and we, and which is the best method for all yeah that's all about my presentation i think i needed some more time but anyway i took extra 3 minutes i welcome any questions thank you sir uh, for enlightening us by your in depth space uh, participants questions please if you have any questions please
गुड मॉर्निंग माइसेल दीपंकर भंज फ्रॉम एनआईजी सिल्चर हाय हेलो हाय डॉक्टर भंज या प्लीज टेल सर यू हैव टोल्ड दैट इट इज ट्रू दैट इन एनी डिजाइन पर्सपेक्टिव फॉर एनी थर्मल सिस्टम वी शुड ऑलवेज ट्राई टू मिनिमाइज द एंट्रोपी जनरेशन रेट एंड पैरेलली uh we should also try to minimize this material cost <laughs> so if, uh, if for all the cases uh if the if we try to minimize the entropy and uh, material cost will be uh, maximum no 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 actually this is very interesting question and i don't know uh, you have uh, attended my lecture from, from the beginning or not as i said before joining into the academia i was working with a manufacturing company called boeing i think everyone knows boeing this is the biggest manufacturing aircraft manufacturing company so when i claim that they are saying that it's not universal because when we do the material cost optimization there is no, there is direct manufacturing cost material cost and labor cost tool changing cost so this is actually we can say it's a hypothetical study but if you re- if you really say it's re- claiming is really difficult that every time we really have to minimize but sir whatever cost, it doesn't come sir, whatever cost you have mentioned is it material cost plus operating cost plus maintenance cost everything no no it's here it's only material cost only material cost and uh, my sir cost. another query so you mm-hmm. have uh, means calculated entropy generation uh, in mm-hmm. the uh, sink system Uh, mm-hmm. by uh, means we know that it due entropy generation occurs due to uh, thermal irreversibility as well as the fluid flow irreversibility uh, through the passage so both mm-hmm. you have considered in your study yes yes we have considered both okay sir yeah Thank and you, actually sir. yeah actually if you have more question in thermal side actually i am the optimization expert actually i have a domain expert you can send me email i can actually you can get in touch with him actually he is developing more complicated formulation means he is every month he is making my life difficult by coming with new complicated formulations okay sir okay sir okay sir thank you very much okay, welcome any more questions participants any questions i think so uh, there is no question sir sir okay yes sir thank you sir for your nice presentation thank you thank now you i want to hand over to dr biplav das for proceed to the next Dr. Biplav Das, sir. Madam, you proceed. Hello. Madam, you can proceed, madam. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, madam, I'm sorry. My uh, PC, there was a problem. So I don't know anything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, please proceed. So, uh, thank you for and joining us. So, it's a good thing. Now, we have a lot of questions. May I now request? जॉइनिंग Yes, 
Hello? Yeah, Dr. Subhajit. Uh, am I, I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, okay. Please uh, introduce the speaker with our uh, audience. Subhajit, please. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me introduce to uh, all of you uh, Professor Balaji Raghavan. Professor uh, Balaji Raghavan is a tenured associate professor of civil in and chemical engineering at the INSA REN, uh, France since 2013. He obtained his uh, Bachelor of Technology degree in mechanical engineering from IIT Bombay. Uh, his MS in mechanical uh, engineering with a minor in high performance computing from Pennsylvania State University, US. And after that, he joined uh, the Advanced Mechanics Lab, the CNRS lab at UTC Compain, France, where he conducted research in uh, mechanics in general and optimization. After that, he has been continuing his research in INSA REN in multi scale modeling and simulation and multi physics characterization of materials in the lab at INSA REN uh, in the Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, he has published more than 30 uh, papers in Web of Science, Science Index, uh, journals, and uh, more than 50 papers in various conferences, etc. His age index is 15, so he's actively associated with Schweck, uh, Poland, UTC, France. Uh, recently, he has collaborated with NIT Silger also, and uh, he has been the visiting professor of Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an, China. Um, he has served as a guest editor and reviewer for various journals, international journals. He's also the reviewer in national projects in France. So, uh, may I please request Professor Raghavan to start with his uh, talk. Please, sir. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Professor Datta. First of all, I'd like to see, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Excellent, excellent. Now I'm just for the first time I'm going to click present now, and uh, let me see. I just say present my entire screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I hope this works. Okay. Now, uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. It is excellent. visible, sir. Now I'm just going to ask you once more. Uh, now can the can everyone see the presentation? Yes, sir. Excellent. It is in now full screen mode. Yes, 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 sir. yes, yes. Now this is the first time I'm using Google Meet, so oh, I have okay. no idea. I'm, I'm used to Zoom and Tencent in China. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor. So, uh, thank you for welcoming me, everyone. Uh, so, my name is uh, Balaji Raghavan, and uh, I, when I when I got the invitation to present here, I decided to do something a little daring. I uh, decided to broach a subject which is uh, obviously well known, but uh, including in India, but uh, it's not that popular for a variety of reasons that we'll hopefully not have to go into. Uh, topology optimization, because that actually forms the focus of my research for the last three years and where Professor Subhajit Datta is actively involved. And uh, so uh, this is uh, something where, I, this is a subject where I actually began working back in 2006 when I was a master's student in the United States, Penn State. And uh, I actually was able to quickly make a contribution which was respected, uh, you know, just to, the test of time and then for whatever reason i left that subject and i moved into pure mechanics and then when i moved to france for my phd i actually get got back into optimization and model reduction and i steered clear of topology optimization because i just couldn't you know because it, the subject had evolved during my absence and then for a variety of reasons i decided to drift back into it for the last couple of years and uh, I decided actually to uh, present something that uh, forms the uh, focus of our collaboration between uh, NIT Stilchar, UTC, uh, INSA, REN, and the Northwestern Polytechnic University in China. Uh, so let's see how it goes along. All right. So the subject is accelerating topology optimization. Where are we and where do we go next? Okay. So uh, the masters and PhD students involved in the current project, that's Pierre Falipu, uh, who actually has finished his PhD, thankfully. And then you have uh, uh, Dong Cheng Liu, who's actually a very, very uh, enterprising young student from NTU Xi'an, who uh, is currently doing his PhD with us. And obviously, our very own Sugata Mukherjee, who presented yesterday. He's fairly timid, but uh, he's actually got a massive amount of potential from NIT Silchar. Okay. 
So where do I come from? Uh, I know most of you associate France with Paris and uh, sorry to say I'm not from Paris, although I do go there to buy Indian groceries. Uh, I come from a place called Rennes in Brittany in France and these are the four most beautiful pictures that I could find. But the city is actually a very, very, very wonderful place and uh, it's famous because we have one of the uh, best engineering schools uh, and universities technically, Grand École, uh, in France, in Rennes, where I'm the associate professor. Okay. Uh, so who am I? So when they asked me to write a bio, obviously I don't like to write a bio. So I went to my last seminar at the Queen Mary University London, SEMS. So I just copy pasted most of what I had here, replaced it with my current H index and um, affiliations. And that's exactly what you heard. So anyway, outline of today's talk. Now I'm well aware that 95% of uh, the presenters are not involved with or probably haven't aren't really interested in top -off. So I'm going to first focus on why top -off, you know, what is it? Why should we care? Uh, the basic problem formulation, uh, we're not going to go into details because I'm going to first try to interest you, most of the uh, viewers on in top -off, and directly we're going to move into the history and then see, okay, now what are the problems, all right? Uh, so why top -off? All right, top -off because it's, it's just it's something that's exploding over the last several years and uh, it's uh, has so many applications and i've tried to i've tried to find a few applications and luckily there are people who collect for example Neil Zarsh, who's uh, currently uh, actively involved with the uh, with the uh, progenitor of topology optimization so to speak so it has so many applications sadly most of them in defense but uh, not just that i mean they're in extreme materials for example designing uh, meta materials uh, materials that can absorb radar for cloaking, etc. There's in fluid structural optimization. You'll see those. So uh, it's actually well known, uh, especially in China, uh, where topology optimization is used to optimize aerospace brackets. Now the whole idea is we sacrifice aesthetics completely, uh, but the whole goal is minimum weight slash uh, best performance for a given weight. All right. So the whole idea is. You have a comparison between the original part here and uh, the topology optimization optimized part. And you can see that we have essentially, we have to be very clear what performance we are talking about because we could optimize performance in one sense and we could lose out significantly in the other sense. So framing the topology optimization problem is exceptionally important. That said, once it's properly posed and you have the patience to churn out the solution, you're going to be surprised with what is possible. now. Uh, these are obviously not projects that I worked on, but uh, Zhu, who was actively involved in application of uh, topology uh, optimization to uh, the aerospace industry, an aircraft pylon and a front fuselage. Okay, so yes, uh, these are some of the uh, applications back in 2014. So things have evolved then. And this is actually one of the uh, this picture is available on the internet. You can Google it. The Qatar National Convention Center ent entrance. So this has been obtained by uh, topology optimization. So. As you can see, anytime you see some of these solutions, you know that Topop is somewhere in there. So anyway, so why Topop? Because it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous at this point, and it's going to get even more important as more and more countries turn to 3D printing. All right. So then, what is Topop? So uh, Robert Le Ricolet, uh, an engineer philosopher, said the art of structure is knowing where to put the holes. Now, we, the whole idea is, depending on how you put the holes in the structure, you're going to get either something that's a catastrophic failure or something that works pretty well. And that, in a nutshell, sums up topology optimization, knowing where to put the holes. So what does that mean exactly? So before that, there are a variety of approaches in topology optimization. Remember, it started back in 1989, all right, actually 88. But back in 88, it was not known, as far as I'm concerned, as topology optimization. Uh, the density-based approach is the most popular, which is pretty much what I would say most people work on today. Uh, and it's also the simplest in a way. The homogenization approach was actually uh, worked on before by the same, by the progenitors of the subject. Uh, the evolutionary approach came about in 1992. Then you had some work on what we call topological derivatives. The level set method is gaining traction now. I'd say mostly because of, uh, mostly I, I'd say this is because of French research groups. 
And uh, post 2014, and this is something which uh, I have not really worked on, obviously, there's something on moving morphable components and what MMC, MMV, which is again, so this is, this actually sums up the, uh, this is a broad, broadly speaking, these are the uh, different approaches. So just so we are clear, we are going to be focusing on the density approach for the most part, whenever we talk about solutions that I'm showing you, et cetera. Uh, however, the level set method. Now, what is level set? This is going to be interesting. Uh, the level set is now on the top right, you see a typical crude, low resolution density map. All right. The whole idea is if it's white, there's no material there. And if it's black, that the black pixels or voxels in 3D represent material. All right. Now, the whole idea of level sets is you move from a two step zero one indicator function to a a smooth indicator function all right the level set actually has three values it's positive outside negative inside the object and it actually lies at zero on the boundary what that means is instead of getting this pixelated figure that can give people nightmares or make them feel like they're back in the 90s uh the level set method allows you to get a smooth contour now that doesn't mean that you actually solve the problem remember the goal of topology optimization is actually making this optimized part so does the level set have any advantages? Well, you know, we're not going to answer that question at this point because we're just focusing on how things can be sped up and we'll see why that's a key issue. So uh, generally speaking, for topology optimization is simply a PDE constrained optimization, all right? So you have a set of variables, say in the, uh, we want to optimize the density distribution where the density is going to be varying between 0 and 1, for example, or ideally 0, 1. And you have the state variables, all right? So there is a certain performance objective, all right? The performance objective is given by this F of the row distribution and the state variables. Uh, the C constraint actually depends on the PDE. This is very, very, very general. You have a variety of other constraints. It could be volume constraints. In mechanics, you could have stress constraints, for example. This actually looks a lot better when we start focusing on a certain field. Now, this is something which mechanics people are more familiar with. So, in the if the whole idea is this is not how it's done, by the way. All right, this is not the actual manufacturing process. This is just a representation. We want to pour material in certain way so as to respect a certain volume constraint. As in, we don't want to fill the entire domain. We want to know where to put the holes, the voids, and we want to know where. We want to distribute material. So it's a material distribution problem so as to optimize performance subject to a set of constraints. All right. So uh, we want to actually minimize a performance objective, say J, which depends on obviously U, where U is the uh, displacement vector in a continuous phase. U depends on the uh, density variation. All right. Now it could be a continuous variation, it could be a discrete variation. Ideally, we want rho to be just zero and one between zero and one. Uh, obviously, you have the mechanics equation that I, on, in, this is small strain mechanics to simplify things. So uh, we don't have to worry about whether we are in a Lagrangian or an Eulerian formulation. So divergence of sigma just means divergence of sigma. All right. It doesn't matter whether we are referring it to the reference or the current configuration subject to your boundary conditions. So you have your uh, Dirichlet and your uh, Newman conditions as the inverse. Uh, you have a constitutive law and you have a volume fraction. Now, this is obviously useless. For the most part, unless you discretize it, obviously, unless you have a way of getting analytical solutions, which has actually been done at some point. So when you discretize this, you get the familiar KU equals F, where, uh, since I'm lazy, I have absorbed the boundary conditions inside. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I'm talking about the essential boundary conditions, and you have the performance objective, which actually depends on the U, the displacement vector, which depends on what we call the density distribution. Okay, what is this density distribution? Rho now is a discrete vector. And you have the constraints, the element density. This rho is actually the element-wise density vector. So you have a certain set of finite elements, and rho is actually going to be between rho minimum and one. The reason we typically use a rho minimum is it's a it's a computational trick to avoid uh, you know having a stiffness matrix that ends up singular for whatever reason. Uh, and subject to a volume constraint. So we have a density distribution where the densities are ideally going to be a zero one problem subject to the volume constraint. Obviously, if the volume fraction is one, then you can just fill the entire structure. That's not what we're looking for. 
So what are the tools and methods? So you have to have a grid of design variables. OK, so that's generally your finite element mesh. But in general, you could have different grids. OK, I'm, I'm assuming that Sugata mentioned that having diff different grids for the density distribution and for the finite element analysis has certain advantages. You need to have some kind of material property interpolation model. And I'd say that the simplest is still the best. Uh, simply, uh, you'll see that soon. We need to have the physical equation in weak form, eventually discretized. So you need to have finite element grid and a solver, which is where all the fun lies. Either you use a disk, the direct solver, OK? Or you can use the uh, a typical, uh, you know, uh, preconditioned conjugate gradient. So the incomplete Cholesky or the multigrid preconditioned uh, conjugate gradients. You need to have some way of calculating gradients and sensitivities, OK, of the objective function with respect to the densities. Some kind of regularization to uh, relieve numerical instability, avoid checkerboard problems, as Sugata mentioned yesterday, and to limit mesh dependence. And some kind of design updating scheme. So the most popular ones are the uh, method of moving asymptotes and OC, which is just which is what Sugata mentioned yesterday. This is actually the simple material property interpolation. So if you have a finite element, we typically use. Uh, uh, I didn't mention this, but in Topology optimization, for the most part, we use a structured grid and we use voxel or pixel elements. So these are these elements are pixels or voxels, and we use uh, non conforming grids, uh, structured non conforming grids, and each element has usually has the exact same geometry. It's usually, uh, these are, as I said, these are voxel meshes. And for each element, you have a density associated, rho e, which we want to push it between 0 and 1. So the uh, say the Young's modulus has to be a function of rho e. The reason we have a penalty parameter, which is greater than 1, is to force a 0, 1 solution, because we want to avoid grayscale solutions. So this is what it looks like. And I'm hoping this excites at least some of those who uh, haven't really followed this field. So we want to, uh, we, we, this is an MPP beam. Now we want to uh, distribute materials such a way as to optimize the stiffness. Stiffness, I mean, limit the compliance of the structure when it is pressed by a central vertically downward load. All right. So obviously, due to symmetry, we can consider part of this. And the optimal structure actually looks something like this. All right. So the black represents presence of material, and the white means the void. So there's no material there. I hope this is, this is kind of self-explanatory. It actually looks a lot better when you see how this topology optimization actually proceeds. So we start the series of iterations, and the uh, objective function is what we call the uh, strain energy or the compliance density technique. So the optimization slowed down here actually looks kind of like this. You see, the uh, this is the standard simply OC, the fundamental problem which people have been doing. Okay, coded in MATLAB, by the way, as you can make out from the poor quality of the pictures. So you have over a series of iterations, your material is going to be redistributed such a way as to optimize. So we are minimizing the structural compliance. So there are many ways of uh, skinning the cat when you're looking for the stiffest structure. What does the stiffest structure really mean? We could be looking at minimizing the displacement of a point or minimizing the uh, structural compliance, which is most popular, or simply focusing on the uh, first eigenvalue. Okay, so the fundamental frequency. So this is the easiest for a variety of reasons that mostly for simplicity, minimizing compliance is by and large the most popular way to get things done. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work. And luckily, for the context of this presentation, this is pretty much as complex as it gets. So anyway, so it eventually converges. It's already converged, so we're just essentially uh, getting a certain number of um, so anyway, this also works in 3D. And again, everything has been programmed in MATLAB. So you can take simple 3D benchmarks. Uh, they have the uh, MBB beam using, again, simply an MMA in this case, OK, just for so-called scalability. And uh, it looks a lot more interesting. So we want to distribute material in such a way as to, this has been done in MATLAB again. Uh, and it looks really fast, but actually, if you look on the uh, top right corner, you see the CPU time, all right? If anyone's looking at the CPU time, this is without 
reduced order modeling okay you can see how long this takes that's uh, around 10 uh, that's around 15 16000 seconds all right so that basically gives you an idea what we're doing so basic top up flowchart looks a bit like this there's the fem part you have to define your pde correctly and uh, then you have the, within each optimization iteration you have to first do the fea ideally because that's the simplest uh, you can do the sensitivity analysis generally the gradients are obtained by their joint method uh, as sugata probably described yesterday there's some kind of filtering for regularization uh, to limit mesh dependence and uh, obviously for stability reasons and then you have to have some kind of design updating scheme that means the material redistribution till convergence uh, this is the meat and potatoes of it generally okay uh, for the most part we prefer an iterative tcg solution to this essentially it's a trilobe subspace method so uh, you have to find uh, the new descent directions at each step and the advantage of going for an iterative solution is iterative solution is more scalable because it's essentially a lot of matrix products okay so anytime you have the multiplication of matrix and the vector or even the matrix and the matrix you can parallelize it so for reasons of scalability we generally prefer iterative solutions so iterative solvers are usually preconditioned trilobes of space solvers for example concrete gradient MINRES and GMRES, these are there in the literature. Okay. Uh, they have certain advantages. They are obviously, besides scalability, they do not need high accuracy during the early slash intermediate stages, but they typically tend to get ill conditioned later on. So, uh, plain vanilla iterative methods tend to run into difficulties. There are no, so tip up is nice. So, what are the issues here? All right, so you get a beautiful structure. Now, how do you make that? All right, uh, without 3D printing, you have to interpret these optimized solutions. And uh, with 3D printing, that becomes a lot simpler because theoretically, 3D printing can print out anything else. This actually explains why this uh, method has exploded in China and some of the countries where there's a prime focus on 3D printing. Manufacturing related constraints are challenging, including 3D printing. There's are basically length scale constraints. Non-convex formulations, which luckily I haven't had to work on. Stochastic top-up, which uh, hopefully we'll be working on with Professor Datta, who's a specialist in all things stochastic. Multiphysics challenges. It's top-up has been applied to multiphysics problems. However, each different physics besides mechanics brings its own set of challenges. Even in mechanics, a simple non-self-adjoint non problem brings its own set of challenges. Now, the meat and potatoes is you got the FE, the high fidelity solver embedded in a top -off. So the CPU time is prohibitive for high resolution meshes. We want the finer mesh. The memory requirement is nearly always prohibitive. And how do you apply length scale constraints? Okay, so uh, for 3D printing, for example, and the, this is laughable, but even today in 2020, maximum stress constraints give us problems. So we want to, optimize the stiffness but we want to limit the maximum stress inside the material so the manufacturability issue is you have people who have worked on the manufacturability issue uh, there's the work of wong who talked about the uh, general issue of this length scale control is key so you have pulson sang and go who worked on uh, length scale control Targeting conventional machining, injection molding, you've got feature-driven design, which actually has been a key focus from 2015. And uh, the so-called no undercut restriction, which uh, was solved in 2009 by uh, uh, Xiao uh, in, in published in the SMO. So anyway, why did topology op optimization explode recently? Because of recent advances in additive manufacturing. So I believe that these are the main impetus for the sudden increase in popularity of the subject. Additive manufacturing allows for quick and direct fabrication of a complicated optimized topology. Unlike conventional manufacturing, you got laser beam melting and laser metal deposition. Uh, obviously, there are limitations which have been uh, explained in a paper by my former PhD student, Mr. Mengliang. Uh, loss of geometric accuracy and performance deterioration. And, uh, you know, the general premise is you have a topology optimized solution. You have to create the STL file you know, surface triangulation, that's a CAD model. And then after a set of steps, you can export an SLC file to the printer. 
So this is roughly what it looks like. This is obtained from the public domain 3D metal printing magazine uh, from the STL file. Go to the final printed material. Now, as you can see, uh, these solutions are going to be very difficult with conventional manufacturing. Uh, what's the advantage of additive manufacturing? Well, uh, you know, there are a variety of advantages, including obviously the so called buy to fly ratio is significantly lower. So there's less wastage of material when you use additive manufacturing. Bear in mind, the strength of the printed materials is under question. All right. So additive manufacturing, especially 3D printing, isn't the be all and end all. All right. Uh, there's a lot of literature on whether we can trust the uh, printed solutions or not. So the strength of these once printed materials is still an issue. All right. So why is accelerating topology optimization such a key issue? Uh, Mr. Yongsu Choi presented this very succinctly. Uh, you have a initial design. All right. So your initial design. Uh, you have to go through the physics-based PDE, which is obviously high fidelity and is linked with a high uh, resolution mesh and a sensitivity analysis, which can also be time consuming. So what really happens is that 86% of the time involved in optimization is generally spent, at least in this particular problem chosen by Mr. Choi, uh, for solving the physics-based PDE. All right. Now, wind turbine blade design involves fluid structure interaction. And uh, that's very, very computation intensive, but even simple mechanics problems run into those issues. So you have to have a, uh, now, okay. So you'd say, why, why, why can't we just reduce the resolution, use low resolution meshes? The reason is, remember, length scale control is uh, not something that should be dictated by uh, computational <clears throat> CPU clock. Uh, it, unfortunately, it frequently is. So you often need fine resolution for accurate modeling of the physics, number one. And the other thing is, remember, we are approaching a continuous problem. So anytime we impose an artificial length scale, we could limit the solution space and limit performance. Now, this could be a non-issue. It could be an issue. Now, there's actually work by, by Sigmund that shows that in a very well-known problem called the Mitchell uh, structures, he shows that you significantly lose out on uh, the uh, performance objective by artificially limiting the uh, resolution. And also by using a sufficiently high resolution FE mesh, we may obtain finer structures with improved performance. Now, this is a trap. If you say, give me an example, there's plenty. There's also examples where this doesn't happen. Right? <clears throat> but it could. So high resolution topology optimization formulation is in general, I'd say non-negotiable. So we have to find some workaround for the uh, computational cost. And length scale restriction should only be dictated, in my opinion, by manufacturing constraints. <clears throat> so uh, people have been working on reducing computation time and effort for a while. You have adaptive pre refinement, which actually uh, Sugata presented yesterday. You have uh, you have used higher order shape functions, and uh, you have variants of the uh, moving method of moving asymptotes. You got sequential quadratic programming, which was used in 2016. Meshless methods, which seems strange given that this method relies on using a density mesh, but meshless methods have also been tried. And uh, scalability is including interior point algorithms. Now, scalability has been seen to be an issue with these. And also, one of the main advantages of topology optimization is you have what we call heuristic optimizers, which are simple to implement. And the minute you get into complexity, especially when you're losing out on scalability, uh, that's generally not good news. Uh, you have uh, <clears throat> Suresh use the so-called Pareto approach, which for some reason never really took off. So this guaranteed faster convergence of solvers, better condition matrices, and also you could do multiple uh, multi-objective uh, design, which is going to give you multiple optimal topologies for a given volume fraction, but for whatever reason, this hasn't really set the topology optimization world on fire. So anyway, what is the state of the art? And uh, at various points, I have been part of the state of the art for a few of these, quite a few of these. So not all. So you have uh, multi-grid methods, which are probably the most effective, started in 2000. Approximate reanalysis, okay, which uh, I'd say the first official use was in 2001. High performance computing, which everyone likes, which everyone uses without even knowing it, 2001 to present. 
and you got postmodern methods which i like deep learning which uh, honestly there are people who specialize in these i haven't had occasion to work on these however they are there and from what the literature reports these are getting increasingly popular so let's start with something that is close to what i do approximate reanalysis so this is the oldest approach in design optimization the basic idea is so f k k u equals f at each optimization iteration is, com is, com is, is, is expensive. So can you use, can you avoid using, uh, avoid solving KU equals F, okay? Is there any way to reuse previous solutions? So the whole idea is if I change during the optimization, anytime the topology, which means the design, the density map changes, can I predict the new response without again solving KU equals F, you know? So, now, this is considered approximate reanalysis, but the truth is you have to continue solving high fidelity model, but only over a few iterations, hopefully. Okay. So the first major paper was the work of Kirsch and Papalambros using what we call the combined approximation method. Okay. So this is what typically I do. Uh, we use what's called pro projection-based uh, approximate reanalysis, which I, what we do is we hope that there is a space, okay? You have a subspace of M computed solutions and we assume M computed solutions, you want to UM, okay? These are the displacement vectors and you hope that your, your approximate solution uh, belongs to the space. Mm -hmm. And then you use a projection based uh, reduced order model. So phi times alpha, where phi is the basis. And then you get the reduced equations, phi transpose k phi and phi transpose f. So instead of solving k u equals f, can we solve the reduced problem, which is significantly smaller, small k times alpha equals small f, okay? And obviously, this has to be monitored using a uh, projection error criterion. So uh, we use this to monitor the performance of your reduced order model, okay? If, it's, if you use the exact solution, it's going to be zero. So how do we obtain this fee? There are various solutions. So you could use a simple collection of your M solution vectors. It's not going to be autonomous. Uh, people have used uh, the Gram-Schmidt optimal normalization to get a autonomous basis. And typically what I do, the last one is uh, our work with uh, Professor Datta and Professor Shao, a principal components analysis, PCA or POD. Uh, just a nod to the combined approximation method, which was presented by Kirsch in 2001. And they actually stood the test of time. It was used for close to 10 years. Um, I think now uh, the so-called reduced order modeling is uh, gaining traction because of the popularity of machine learning approaches. So the whole idea is if you have, a, you assume that your stiffness matrix, the stiffness matrix depends on the density map, all right? So if you change the density distribution, your stiffness matrix is going to change. So we use this so-called uh, recursive relation to uh, recursive iterative relation to find the new displacement vector because if you can find the new displacement vector when the density map changes uh, you don't have to again solve f equals ku so uh, this is the so-called combined approximation method so your basis is given by a set of your w vectors which have been obtained from the displacement vectors now u1 has to be calculated okay and the whole idea is, can we generate UI directly from U1? So some key developments in approximate uh, reanalysis have been obviously combined approximations. you got Wong's MINRES. Uh, Amir, another who has been one of the luminaries in uh, <clears throat> topology optimization. Uh, then you got ROMs, that means reduced order models, have been applied by Yoon, Gogu, and finally, by us. And you've got multiple preconditioners, kind of recycling. You've got uh, Choi, who seems to be uh, doing a lot of work using a combination of ML and DL at this point. So I go directly to what we introduced in 2020, which was similar to what was introduced in 2015. Uh, so we have what we call the on the fly ROMs. Okay. So on the fly ROMs are uh, the whole idea is that you have to solve your equilibrium equation for a certain minimum number of you know iterations so uh, you get a set of uh, <clears throat> you get a set of solution vectors and then you decide how many modes you want to retain okay so if 
your loop is NB, then you have to calculate phi from, you know, U1 to UM, and you're going to use the reduced order model, okay? Otherwise, you have to get the solution from phi transpose KU equals phi transpose F using the error criteria, okay? So the whole idea is for the first NB uh, displacement vectors, you have to solve them using KU equals F. But once you have passed that on, you actually have to remove the oldest snapshot and you have to substitute that with the newest snapshot, okay? And you again use, P, you, you can use what Graham Smith or PCA as if you have used to find the basis. Now, everything is monitored by your error criterion. So what is uh, POD slash PCA? So this is actually the foundation of my uh, work when I applied PCA to a variety of mechanics-based problems. Uh, so consider the uh, centered snapshot matrix. Now, your M displacement vectors are actually considered snapshots, displacement snapshots. So you have to center these snapshots and then get the covariance matrix and perform the singular value decomposition of these, which gives you psi. Now, the first NB columns of psi are going to give you, and how do you choose these NB columns based on the most energetic modes uh, of, after the uh, singular value decomposition and use this en energy so-called energy criterion to decide how many modes are we going to retain, NB modes out of M snapshots. Uh, and the first NB columns of psi are actually going to be your um, your feet, which is the the, 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 the the basis matrix, which is retained for generating the reduced order model for you. So how does this actually work? It works pretty well. Uh, we actually compared uh, for a variety of meshes. Uh, the whole idea is that if you have a certain number of iterations, say 100 loop iterations for the optimization, without the reduced order model, you're actually going to be, if you have 100 loop iterations, you're going to call F equals KU 100 times, right? Uh, with the reduced order model, how many, how, how, of, how, how many times do you call the reduced order model? Remember, the minute your, uh, your minute your epsilon RB is higher, you have to again reevaluate your PO, your PCA basis. So the basis is going to be refined each time. Uh, uh, each time your reduced order model loses accuracy. So based on that, you can see that uh, without if what happens is the red curve in the top one represents the number of calls to the full field model, and the green one represents calls to the reduced order model. So after a certain breakpoint, we actually find that the calls to the reduced order model are outpace the calls to the full feed model. And this actually works out perfectly because the full the reduced order model is going to consume far less computational time. And what we plotted here are the calls to the full field model. And uh, obviously the proof is in the pudding. So uh, for this particular problem using this particular mesh, uh, this is pretty much what we've obtained as far as the uh, iteration history, okay, the time history as a function of obviously the compliance. And on the uh, x-axis, we have CPU clock time, showing that it actually converges a significantly faster. Uh, this is the future, so we're not actually going to go into this, but this is hopefully going to be part of uh, Sugata's work. So instead of using the regular SPD, we use the so-called incremental SPD, where the uh, we actually reperform the SPD column by column. Okay, so we don't have to, because the actual SPD actually still cons consumes some amount of computational time. So to avoid this, we go through what's called incremental SPD. So uh, this hopefully we'll be able to present. So Vata will be able to present uh, the next time uh, he presents before you. So we go off into the uh, second approach, HPC, which was actually my, I, I, I worked on this uh, back in 2006. So there are some key concepts, which I'm sure there are many who are specialists in high performance computing. I'm not one of them. Uh, you have Moore's law, which emphasizes width over length. You've got Amdahl's law, domain decomposition, explicit versus implicit, which basically means how do you decompose the domain? You have a set of processes. How do you distribute the workflow? Are you going to explicitly divide your design domain or are you going to divide your matrix, the matrix that you are you going to break up the matrix? It's not necessarily the same. Shared memory and distributed memory is, uh, they bring up individual challenges and individual advantages. Interprocessor communication in, in uh, distributed memory systems is always a concern. Uh, you have obviously open memory, 
OpenMP, which is used in shared memory architecture versus MPI. A good distinction between parallel and numerical scalability, which are not the same. And depending on the situation, you might prefer one over the other. Speed up is how we actually rate any approach. The so-called single program multi-data approach, which, uh, which is what uh, I worked on back in 2006. Uh, then the advent of GPUs completely changed uh, your uh, changed the game for topology optimization and uh, so-called CUDA, which uh, I'm sure anyone who's in computing will be able to elaborate on that. So anyway, Moore's law basically said that the uh, number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles every two years. So basically, instead of trying to in increase the speed of a single processing unit, we tried to put more transistors on a single chip. Unfortunately, I believe, and I'm sure someone will correct me on this, uh, Moore's law at this point, we can no longer, or at least we are close to the point that we can no longer respect Moore's law because we can no longer add uh, transistors to a chip, all right, for, for a variety of reasons not related to Moore's law. And as law actually gives a theoretical speed up in execution for a fixed workload. So the same job when you have multiple processors based on the percentage of time that the algorithm has spent in the uh, serial mode and the parallel mode. So uh, you, you, you have the uh, distributed computing power today has reached 2.3 exaflops the last time we updated uh, and checked it out. Petaflop computers are actually common in very large research organizations. And let's be honest, with the decrease in cost of computer hardware, almost any research group has some kind of access to parallel computing systems. So I would say this is something that has to be there, OK? This has to be there. So uh, if you're doing some kind of uh, high performance, you're doing some kind of computation intensive job, you have to have some kind of HPC. So I'd say Borwal and Peterson uh, published the first parallel strategy for 3D Topop on a Cray supercomputer back in 2003. And as expected, they uh, were limited to a single precision, OK? The conversion rate was slow. This was followed by works by Kim Vemaganti. Uh, and in 2006, uh, this is actually my work with uh, Arash Madhavi. Uh, we probably were the first to uh, talk about a variety of things. So we presented the master slave paradigm, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Uh, with the uh, simple, and this is where we could have improved at that point. Sadly, we did not use the Jacobi PCG. Uh, and then some interesting. Ebgrafov's papers actually give you a lot of perspective on how to uh, do this thing correctly. And he actually critically, he had a critical, he, had, he critiqued some of the previous works, including my own. So uh, this is actually uh, my work back in 2006, where we presented the single SP, we did the SPMD using a preconditioned conjugate gradient. Uh, we used explicit de domain decomposition, which is a brute force decomposition, which is in probably still up, still uh, attractive, depending on the situation. So the whole idea is, how do you solve f equals ku? So the master performs certain jobs, and the master takes charge of assembly. But assembly, not of the stiffness matrix. In this, the specialty of this approach was we avoided any kind of assembly of the uh, global stiffness matrix. So the conjugate gradient approach was literally only vectors are assembled by the master, and the slaves perform all matrix vector uh, multiplications. So the PCG was implemented in once again in this particular fashion. So the the master is going to perform. Master doesn't perform any jobs, so to speak. The master has to uh, send pieces to each partition, each vector to the processors, and each vector is each slave is going to look for its own portion of the stiffness matrix or the elements under its own purview, and perform the multiplications, and send the products back to the master for assembly of the vectors, not matrices. Uh, there's also the uh, shared memory uh, version of this on the right, which simply does more or less the same thing. But since it's shared memory, there is no interprocessor communication because the memory is shared. However, this is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, the SPMD implementation of Topop for three different meshes uh, was uh, fairly entertaining at that point in 2006. Obviously, we have. Uh, we are now getting to 300 megaflops is nothing, but you need to increase the problem size drastically in, in order to get really hardcore performance today. Uh, 
So anyway, HPC has been used in Topop by a variety of people. Okay, so uh, this is post GPUs. Okay, so post GPUs, the first official use of GPUs was by Bardrow in 2009. And after that, there's virtually no one who has tried to use CPUs because GPUs have completely taken over the field. So you have works by Schmidt, Suresh, Dallas, uh, Zegard. And Zegard's work is actually very, very good because this is still today the only work which involves using unstructured meshes, which are actually necessary for very complex design domains, loadings, constraints, and G. And uh, while obviously the performance of topology optimization on an unstructured mesh is going to be inferior to that on a structured mesh, that is completely obvious. But this is actually, I consider this as one of the most important work because uh, in, in real life, sometimes you may need to use unstructured meshes. You can't keep publishing your results on structured meshes. So uh, here, for example, uh, I would say Fritzen and Breitkopf uh, were probably the first to apply this whole method to nonlinear materials involving homogenization. Uh, so they also used the modern model reduction technique was actually simply the POD, which was a part of my PhD thesis. And anyway, GPU, uh, the GPU algorithm is extremely complex. So a simplified approach is what we do is you need CPUs. Okay, the CPU is actually going to copy the vectors from the host to the GPU devices. So what we do is that the intra loop computations are performed using the CPU, GPUs, but uh, the CPU does all the work related to system parameters, definitions, the pre finite element operations, initialization, and the CPU actually does all the sorry all the copying work from host to device memory, whereas the GPUs do the uh, I would say the donkey work, uh, I mean the, the real work, as in the uh, solving f equals ku calculation of sensitivities, which is also time consuming. And the CPU again has to copy the updated density map back. Now, parallel versus numerical scalability, simply put, this is important. Parallel scalability means you have the same problem size, but you want to solve the same problem size faster. You don't want to increase the size of the problem. That is parallel scalability. Whereas numerical scalability means that you want to increase the complexity of your algorithm complexity of your problem. that means you want to increase the size of your problem and how does how does it scale up when you increase the size of the problem that is numerical scalability it's not the same as keeping the same job same size problem and uh, running it on multiple processors so the bulk of hpc works actually relate to parallel scalability the reason is these give you very nice speed up charts but numerical scalability is often the true measure of uh, how effective your algorithm is mind you in my own work we only reported you know uh, we mostly reported parallel scalability, but the reason numerical scalability is an issue is that sometimes the computational con uh, the computation complexity will grow. So you're not ideally you want a linear increase, which is rarely going to happen because there could be an increase in number of iterations for convergence with problem size for the same error criteria. So it's often not going to linearly scale up. So in general, you need both parallel as well as numerical scalability. You have a variety of works here from Age to uh, the latest is probably Sotropoulos, who uh, presented their uh, so called SIMP optimality criteria top up module. So, this is probably the state of the art today, uh, this module uh, on uh, using HPC setups. And it has been coupled with a commercial structural software. So, what can we hope to achieve? And uh, this is actually the work by Liu in SMO. Because most, most papers actually don't really report the uh, parallel performance and scalability in their uh, papers. This is actually a sad fact. So this is the closest that I could find. So what can be, what, this, this actually doesn't relate to the actual uh, topology optimization, only the FEA portion. So ideally, we want, obviously, it's never going to happen, but we want the speed up to be the same as the number of processors. If you use 40 processors, you want it to be 40 times faster. This is never going to happen. But you can see that we are able to get speed ups of close to 20 uh, using uh, compact supported radial basis functions and uh, for different support radii. So this is in, in the context of topology optimization, knowing, remember, the FEA in topology optimization is not straightforward FEA for the simple reason that you have a varying density distribution. So you, the matrices are typically not very well conditioned. So you can't compare topology optimization related finite elements with 
regular finite elements okay because the density is varying the, you don't have the you have certain elements which are going to have vanishingly low uh, stiffnesses so what do we do and this is what is important proper implementation of top requires technology as well as formulation uh, each strategy has limitation advantages hpc is a necessity if you're not using some form of hpc then that would be an exception rather than no gpus are not the holy grail they are faster than cpus but the time needed for transferring large amounts of data from CPU to GPU could lead, because you need a CPU still, could lead to significantly higher overhead. And although they have several cores, GPU cores or GPU cores is going to run slower than CPU cores. And also GPUs are prone to memory issues. Uh, from the point of view of interprocessor communication, MPI, which is used on distributed memory setups, requires a lot of communication due to message passing. OpenMP seem, seemingly avoids interprocessor communication, but because we are limited to the existing memory, this could limit the scale of the calculation. Uh, how do you, can you combine uh, MPI with, with, uh, with the GPUs? And the only solution I could find is uh, in the literature is by Evan in the Euro MPI conference 2016, where he presented so-called CUDA aware MPI. So if there's any computing person who's uh, interested in getting into topology optimization, please take a look at this. Uh, the whole idea is what happens when your uh, data size is too large to fit into the limited memory capability of a single CPU. And obviously, scalability, so obviously you're using a state of solver, direct solvers are out of the question. And uh, something like MMA is going to generally be more, more, uh, more uh, scalable. Okay? Multigrid methods, these are the most effective bar none methods for top of it. Okay? The whole idea is do you have to solve everything on the highest resolution mesh or can you iteratively use solutions on a lower resolution mesh? Okay, so remember, K equals F is easier to solve on a lower resolution grid, but we want a solution on a higher resolution grid. So the whole idea is we have multiple levels of resolution. So the multi-grid method essentially redistributes the problem on a variety of grids of different sizes and they try to accelerate convergence, okay? So there are a different set of steps for uh, in MG. So you have the so-called discretization, which requires a stable discrete form of the PD, which is not really the case in topology optimization. Mind you, F equals KU is generally stable, but when you add varying densities where certain elements can have vanishingly low densities, in general, the F equals KU in topology optimization is not always stable. Yes, we have workarounds by keeping a minimum row or a minimum uh, Young's modulus, etc., to avoid uh, singularities but that's 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 not really taking care of the stability problem that's a computational workaround so you got so-called relaxation restriction and you got two main steps restriction and prolongation now restriction allows you to transfer the error from the uh, or the residual from the finest grid which is called omega one to the coarsest grid and prolongation goes in the opposite sense how do you go from a from a coarse grid to a fine grid Okay, so you have to be able to move. Now, depending on how you move from coarse grid to fine grid, in the approach, typically we try to double step size or half step size, depending on what direction you're moving on. A typical V cycle looks this way, all right? So you go from a fine to a coarse and back to fine. So fine to coarse is the coarsening operation. Uh, remember, when you're going from fine to coarse, you're actually doing what you call restriction. And when you go from coarse to fine, you have what you call relax, a prolongation, okay? So using combination of restriction and prolongation, uh, this I invite you to take a look at those of you who are interested in the my, my most, our most recent publication, the so-called V-cycle uh, multigrid method. So the whole idea is UL plus one is, so you're going from, si from uh, grid L to L plus one, and GL is going to be a, basically an approximation to your uh, inverse okay, of K. Now, obviously, if GL is really KL inverse, then you're going to solve the problem correctly, okay? So what the whole idea is, we want to shift from omega one to omega M, the finest to the coarsest, and at each level, your uh, number of elements is simply going to be NELX, NELY, NELZ, this is the voxel mesh, divided by two to the power L minus one. And what we did essentially is combine uh, uh, approximate P analysis with the multigrid method. So the whole idea is, and this is the algorithm. Uh, we have already seen how 
how we can use approximate free analysis. But we actually combine, we have a two way communication between the so called uh, approximate the reduced order model, which is again POD and the high frequency solution. But you also have the switching, the V cycle uh, iteration between the different grid levels. Okay. So, what can we really expect? And this is uh, the, these are the results we got. So, using a combination of PCA, ROM, and MG, we found that. We found that uh, the uh, PCA and MG was actually uh, was actually able to significantly reduce computation time for certain test cases, and it was not that much more effective than MG for certain other test cases. Okay, and uh, the other issue with the uh, reduced order model, which is PCA essentially, is how many modes do you take? Because it's not very clear what is the optimal number of modes. So there is some amount of, and this depends on the problem on the consideration. So yes. Uh, if you're carefully going to select the number of modes in the PCA, then you should get significantly improved, improved um, uh, acceleration. Uh, so anyway, uh, top M multigrid methods started being officially used in uh, topology optimization circa 2000. Uh, the works, the, the, those who really contributed most are Kim and Rare. Uh, so there's a variety of uh, approaches and uh, a variety of approaches that were tried and i would say that we were the first to couple mg with uh, the pod based uh, ar so to be perfectly honest the improvements were relatively modest if you consider all possible test cases especially when you come to compliant mechanism design but uh, you know uh, we did not use an adaptive stopping criterion which is probably something that mr liu is going to uh, is going to try out uh, next Emerging methods, and this will be fast. Uh, the whole idea is that computational mechanics now no longer insists on constructive models. Can we use soft computing? That means, can we find statistically significant patterns in material data? This is the so called data driven approach. So, can we completely bypass the constructive model? Do we even have to solve the ethical scale? Now, uh, machine learning, artificial neural networks, technically, our PCA or POD based reduced order model. Could be class should be classified under machine learning techniques. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning stemming from so-called bio-inspired AMN. Now, this we're just going to go rapidly because I don't really work in this area. Uh, the first real use was uh, shallow neural networks, and uh, the dawn of soft computing in Topop started with Oleg in 2014. So it, this is actually really really new. Uh, Artificial neural networks, I would say the work of Sosnovic in 2017 is the most important. And interestingly, it's only a preprint. It hasn't been published. Sosnovic's 2017 work where he used the so-called deep convolutional encoder-decoder architecture uh, is the most important work related to ANNs. Okay? At, at the, mo the most pioneering work. And post that, the work of Calioras, who used what you call a generative adversarial network, uh, published in SMO, uh, the so-called deep belief networks, where what's interesting is they only train their model using simple 2D test cases for a fixed set of boundary conditions and loading conditions. But reportedly, their trained deep belief network was eventually able to predict optimal topologies for any 2D or 3D test cases, regardless of boundary loading conditions or problem size. So while things need to be verified and we need a lot, we need to wait to see how things pan out with uh, deep learning, etc. I think this gives us a glimpse into the full potential of artificial intelligence if properly applied in this field. But for the most part, I think we'd have to stick with uh, so regular machine learning approaches using K-means clustering, uh, POD, PCA. Is real-time structural design a possibility? So answering that everything is data. So can we sidestep the physics behind the system and directly work on data as and when it's being acquired should make this happen? Summing up, TOPOP is admittedly computation heavy. Okay. And this, among a variety of other problems, has is continuing to hinder its widespread acceptance in industry, despite the fact that ANSYS and most other uh, commercial solver platforms uh, do, ex do perform some kind of topology optimization. In this day and age, we have computing power and resources, and we have 3D printing, which is not necessarily uh, the case with every country I'm aware that can take advantage of the methodology. The ultimate goal of accelerating large-scale top would be real-time design. So what we focus is on 
key developments in a variety of areas related to attenuating some of these issues such as HPC, approximate reanalysis, MG methods, uh, reduced order models, and deep learning, which is which seems exciting. Each approach comes with its own sets of problems and advantages. We believe that a judicious combination of the uh, approaches can yield superior acceleration compared with using them in standalone fashion. HPC has to be there. So it's an evolving field. So using GPUs as well as CPUs with possibly CUDA-aware MP. And we believe that combining MG and AR as of today is going to reap the highest dividends out of all the other approaches. Okay, so these are just some of the uh, selected publications. The AI, which was presented the first two are the most recent, first three are the most recent, uh, related to this particular subject and to principal computing, uh, principal component analysis. Okay, with that, I am. Uh, I uh, that, that that sums up my talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for your insightful presentation. Sir, we can take uh, one or two questions from the participants. Participants, please. Any questions, please? Uh, yeah, okay. I have a small query to Professor Balaji. Uh, yes. Is like how how do you expect the uh, performance of IGA with uh, reduced order models or the approximate reanalysis methods that you discussed? The yeah. isogeometric <laughs> analysis. Yes, that requires a huge computing time. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, uh, I I purposely avoided this because this is something that I was uh, this is something that we have uh, planned out. We were planning out as a potential research topic. So IGA in isogeometric analysis has is slowly creeping into topology optimization. In fact, a lot of topology optimization today uses isogeometric analysis. And uh, what that means is what IGA basically does is it's a form of key refinement where we are adding degrees of freedom along. Uh, specified boundaries and we should be able to get better representations of the uh, boundaries and uh, this is this obviously is going to fix most of the issues with regular density based topology optimization now the issue with iga is it's actually time consuming uh, so what are what 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 we should do is iga is already done on parallel okay just like hpc as i said is already part and parcel of what's happening today uh, where we can step in with IG, and I really hope no one uh, takes this idea and runs with it, at least not before we do, uh, is I feel that principal component analysis using a reduced order model. So once you get the so-called IGA basis, okay, uh, I, once, once you get IG, you do it, applying PCA on that basis is going to get your new improved basis. So essentially using reduced order modeling or PCA with IGA is uh hopefully going to be the next big thing so i don't know if that answers your question so the whole idea is using pca with yeah yeah, yeah yes so, yeah this needs investigation because this iga takes a lot of time yes okay thank you thanks a lot for your uh, answer yes and i'm really hoping no one runs with that before we work on it <laughs> any more questions Participants, any more questions, please? Uh, I don't think so, madam. You can uh, you can proceed. Yes, yes, I think so. There is no question. Uh, sir, once again, I want to thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you. Thank so much. you, sir. Uh, now Thanks over to Dr. Vipla. How do I switch this? Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Agavan, sir. Uh, for your nice presentation and thank you once again for accepting our invitation to be part of Comso. Uh, but uh, because of your uh, this pandemic, we could not uh, this one invite you and bring your energy. So hope you will be able to this one invite you again. Thank you very much. So this keynote session is over. Uh, we will start our uh, technical session very soon.
please uh, i request the presenter be ready and stay tuned with us